call to order this special session on of Wednesday, October 11th, 2023. Madam Clerk, I invite you to call the roll. Councilmember Flaherty? Here. Rosenbarger? Here. Sims? Here. Piedmont Smith? Here. Scambalori? Here. Rollo? Here. Sandberg? Here. Smith? Here. Van Volen? And I'll invite Vice President Piedmont Smith to continue with our land and labor acknowledgement. Thank you. We recognize that the city of Bloomington sits on native land. The city, as well as city administrative buildings, are on the traditional homelands of the Miami, Delaware, Potawatomi, and Shawnee people. And we acknowledge that they are past, present, and future caretakers of this land. We also acknowledge that much of the economic progress and development in Indiana and in Bloomington resulted from the unpaid labor and forced servitude of people of color, specifically enslaved African labor. We acknowledge that this land remains home to and a site of gathering and healing for many indigenous and other people of color, and we commit to the work necessary to create and promote a more equitable and just Bloomington. We move forward knowing and acknowledging our rich, complicated, and sometimes painful past so that we can learn from it and create a true land of opportunity. Thank you. Continuing with the agenda summation, we have six pieces of legislation for second reading tonight, all related to the upcoming budget. We'll begin with Ordinance 2325, an ordinance to fix the salaries of appointed officers, non-union, and AFSCME employees for all the departments of the City of Bloomington, Monroe County, Indiana, for the year 2024. I understand we have one amendment there as well to discuss. We'll continue with Ordinance 2326 to fix the salaries of all elected city officials for the City of Bloomington for the year 2024. Then we'll take up Ordinance 2324, an, ord an ordinance fixing the salaries of officers of the police and fire department for the city of Bloomington, Indiana for the year 2024. I understand that we have two amendments there as well to discuss. We'll then take up Appropriation Ordinance 2306, an ordinance adopting a budget for the operation, maintenance, debt service, and capital improvements for the water and wastewater utility departments of the city of Bloomington, Indiana for the year 2024. We'll take up then Appropriation Ordinance 2307, Appropriation and Tax Rates for Bloomington Transportation Corporation in 2024. We'll then move to Appropriation Ordinance 2305, an ordinance for the appropriations and tax rates, establishing the 2024 Civil City Budget for the City of Bloomington. And I understand we have one amendment there. We will then take up matters of council schedule, and then we'll adjourn. So with that, let's move directly into legislation. Madam President, I move that ordinance 2325 be introduced and read by the clerk by title and synopsis only. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor of the motion to introduce indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion passes. Will the clerk please read? Ordinance 325, an ordinance fixing the salaries of appointed officers, non-union and AFSCME employees for all, this, for all the departments of the City of Bloomington, Monroe County, Indiana for the year 2024. The synopsis is as follows. Ordinance 2325 sets the maximum 2024 salary for all appointed officers, non-union and AFSCME employees for all the departments of the City of Bloomington, Indiana. Your due pass recommendation was 900. Thank you. I move that Ordinance 2325 be adopted. Second. Thank you. And is there any comment from the administration? Thank you very much. Very briefly, Mayor John Hamilton here. Uh, just to kick off the evening with all six of these, uh, this, as you know, is the culmination of really a six month plus process. I want to thank the council for this and let the public know all that uh, has been going on over the last uh, several months. Um, also, just reminding folks. We're presenting balanced budgets tonight, a total of $151 million for the civil city budget, including the three other uh, divisions, uh, two of whom will be in the ordinances tonight, $248 million. Uh, it is a very strong fiscal position. We are also continuing the 2023 transformational budget that we 
put in place for this year with its focus on climate, inclusion, opportunity for all, and an increased quality of life in our community. Uh, and as we've talked about several times for 2024, uh, with a focus on making sure we're an employer of choice for all of our employees, focusing on some public safety enhancements that we have in the 24 budget, and as you know as well, a one-time set of about $19 million to continue to recover forward work, uh, building great momentum in our community. Two weeks ago, we gave you a memo detailing that, and we shared another memo tonight uh, uh, with more information about that plan. Uh, this budget will grow our middle class in the community. It will help continue to build a great quality of life for all of the people here, and it will take care of our employees. I want to thank you for your support in advance, your consideration, collaboration on this. Uh, I'm happy I'll be here tonight to take questions, and I'm handing over now for the first of those to uh, Corporate Counsel uh, Beth Kate, who can jump into the salary ordinance. Thanks. Good evening, council members, uh, Corporation Council Beth Kate. I am here uh, to uh, stand a little bit for Emily Fields, who is uh, at home, and I have with me Erica DeSantis, who's kindly joined uh, Director of Compensation and Benefits to go ahead and present on the salary ordinances. Uh, and I'll do my best to answer your questions uh, as well. But first, I just want to uh, uh, briefly introduce them in this way. So there are three salary ordinances before you tonight. As you know, for the benefit of the public, a salary ordinance is an ordinance that's required by state code. As part of the annual city budgeting process, it fixes the compensation for city personnel. Uh, state code requires such ordinances for elected officials, for appointed officials, sorry, appointed officers and employees of the civil city, appointed officers and employees of uh, City of Bloomington Utilities, after approval of the Utilities Service Board, uh, which is also required by state code. Uh, and for personnel uh, who are covered by collective bargaining agreements, uh, which is currently uh, police, fire, and AFSCME uh, employees, these ordinances reflect uh, the pay terms in the collective bargaining agreements. So you have uh, the ordinances 23-24, uh, 5, and 6. In front of you, it sounded like uh, the order in which you want to take those is 24 last. Um, so what I'm going to do is just uh, very briefly indicate uh, what these are doing, and then again, try and take your questions uh, if I can. So uh, let me start with 23-25. Uh, um, so this ordinance reflects certain new uh, positions, some additional staff hours for existing positions, which are described in the memo that you received earlier, uh, and some title and pay grade changes. Um, regular employees covered under this ordinance will receive a 5% increase this year, or the coming year, as well as a $500 bonus payment. Uh, the pay rate and title changes are included in this ordinance for common law, what are really temporary employees, and that reflects an update in the living wage. So an update in those hourly rates, and that has increased from uh, $15.29 an hour to $15.75 an hour. Okay, so those are kind of the highlights of that ordinance. Again, uh, happy to uh, answer any questions about any specifics of that that you uh, have or want to go into. And I can move to the next one if not. You're very welcome. We also have a, a cleanup amendment submitted at the request of the administration as well. Before we take that up, are there any questions from council? Council member Piedmont Smith. Yes, thank you, um, Ms. Kate. Uh, what is the increase for AFSCME unionized employees? 5%. Also 5%. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Additional questions? Seeing none, do we have an amendment? Yes, Madam President, I move Amendment 1 to Ordinance 2325. Second. Sorry, second. It's been moved and seconded. This was uh, prepared at the request of the Human Resources Department um, because there was just a mistake in where the Senior Environmental Planner was listed. Um, that position is under the um, Planning Services Division of Planning and Transportation instead of under the Development Services Division. So this just corrects that. Thank you. 
Are there any questions on Amendment 1? Seeing none, we'll, we'll go to public comment on Amendment 1 to Salary Ordinance 2325. Is there anyone in chambers who would like to offer a comment on Amendment 1? And Mr. Lucas, could you please extend our invitation on Zoom? Yes, if any members of the public wish to comment on this amendment, please raise your hand in Zoom. You can find the raise hand button in your control bar under the reactions tab or the more tab. You can also send a chat to the meeting host to let us know you'd like to speak. Going up. Okay, in which case, let's come back to council for any questions or final comments on amendment 01. Seeing none, Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll on Amendment 1 to Ordinance 2325? Yes, Councilmember Flaherty? Yes. Rosenbarger? Yes. Sims? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Scambalori? Yes. Rallo? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Smith? Yes. Volan? Yes. Thank you. That passes 9-0 which takes us back to Ordinance 2325 as amended. Are there any questions from Council? Seeing none, let's go to public comment on Ordinance 2325 as amended. If there is anyone in chambers who wishes to uh, offer comment on 2325, please approach the podium. Mr. Lucas, can you extend our invitation on Zoom, please? Yes, if there are any members of the public that wish to speak to this uh, salary ordinance, please raise your hand or send a chat to the meeting host. No takers on Zoom. Okay. Seeing no one wishing to offer comment, let's come back to City Council for any questions or final comment on Ordinance 2325. Council Member Flaherty, then Council Member Piedmont Smith. It would apply, I think, both to this ordinance as well as a later appropriation ordinance, and that has to do with uh, Bloomington Municipal Code uh, 2.04.150. So, as some of you know, um, my wife serves as the Assistant Director of the Planning and Transportation Department, and uh, we are voting tonight on legislation related to the city budget for 2024. By voting on this budget, I would be voting in part on funds for a departmental budget that would include salary for my spouse. Um, so the provision in local code that I mentioned, uh, BMC 2.04.150, applies to a situation uh, where a council member would be required to take action on a matter where they have a direct financial interest, which is more than minimal in nature or different from that shared by the general public. Uh, in such a situation, code directs that the council member must explain the potential conflict and either ask that he be excused from voting, deliberating, or taking action on the matter, or state why he is able to participate fairly, objectively, and in the public interest despite the potential conflict. In this case, I wish to declare my potential conflict and state that the salary for my spouse is part of a larger departmental budget and aligns with city policies and practices that apply to non-union city employees, as was explained uh, during departmental budget hearings um, by the um, Interim Director for Human Resources Department. Uh, additionally, because of the size and significance of the overall budget, I believe I have a duty to participate in order to effectively represent the constituents of the city. And finally, uh, in doing so, I intend to carry out those duties fairly, objectively, and in the public interest, and believe I'm able to do so. Thanks. Thank you, Councilmember Flaherty. Councilmember Piedmont Smith. Yes, um, I just wanted to note uh, that this salary ordinance does include um, a substantial number of new staff positions. Uh, there's a total of 31.95 new FTE in the uh, mayor's budget proposal for next year. Um, I'm not opposed to um, adding these positions, uh, but I did want to note for the public that your city government is growing. Um, it is trying to keep up with the services that we provide for residents of Bloomington. Um, and uh, so that's one thing I wanted to note. Um, there are uh, some positions in particular that, um, that I think are, uh, uh, indicate a, a good direction for, um, for the city. Uh, in the CFRD, um, there's an, another after hours ambassador. We have one such position now that um, 
uh, serves as liaison um, to um, some of our social service organizations in uh, communicating with the unhoused and other people downtown, and also um, talks a lot with our local businesses and kind of is a, a point person after hours for um, any activities downtown that may be of concern. So that's, that's a great addition in my view. Um, we also have um, three uh, additional community uh, EMTs or paramedics in the fire department that um, uh, build on the success that the previous positions um, have seen. Uh, that aspect of our um, fire service is I think very important in connecting people with services and um, eliminating uh, some of the frequent flyers, frequent calls to 911 by um, just connecting people with uh, ongoing assistance as needed. Um, so I just want to point out uh, those, those items uh, and also um, say that I'm pleased that the salary ordinance contains a significant um, pay increase for our um, city council attorney administrator uh, who does uh, excellent work for us. Um, that position uh, of course, the, the raise is for the position and considering the responsibilities of that position um, and the uh, importance of, um, of the legal advice and the um, kind of administrative coordination that that position performs, I think that this is a, a very fair um, salary increase for that job. So I just wanted to mention those things and happy to vote in support. Thank you. Additional comments? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, I invite you to call the roll on Ordinance 2325 as amended. Councilmember Rosenbarger? Yes. Sims? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Scandaluri? Yes. Rollo? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Smith? Yes. Bolin? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. And that passes 9-0. Thank you, everyone. That takes us to Ordinance 2326. Madam President, I move that Ordinance 2326 be introduced and read by the clerk by title and synopsis only. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor of the motion to introduce, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Madam Clerk, will you please read? Ordinance 2326. to fix the salaries of all elected city officials for the city of Bloomington for the year 2024. The synopsis is as follows. This ordinance sets the maximum 2024 salary rate for all elected, elected city officials for the city of Bloomington. Your due pass recommendation for ordinance 2326 was 810. Madam President, move that ordinance 2326 be adopted. Second. Thank you. Ms. Kate? Thanks. Uh, before I start, let me uh, thank uh, Councilmember Piedmont Smith for uh, reminding us about the $10,000 increase for the Council Attorney Administrator. I meant to mention that actually in my summary and I forgot. And as long as I'm at the microphone, I'll take this opportunity to echo everything you said about uh, the um, Council Attorney and Administrator because he's uh, an excellent colleague and he's a treasurer and provides great service to this body. So. Uh, on um, Ordinance 2326, uh, as just noted, um, this covers uh, the salaries and fixes the salaries for elected city officials for the coming year. Uh, highlights are that the uh, clerk's maximum salary uh, represents a 34% increase, uh, and the other elected official salaries will increase by 5%, uh, so in parity with other uh, increases mentioned before. Um, it also, uh, Ordinance 2326 also assigns an additional uh, $1,000 per year stipend payment for the City Council President and an $800 uh, per year payment for the City Council Vice President to reflect the additional responsibilities uh, of those positions. Um, and with that, I'm happy to try to take questions. Thank you. Are there any questions? Seeing none, let's go to public comment. For those in chambers who would like to make a comment on Ordinance 2326, 
Uh, please go ahead and approach the podium. Mr. Lucas, can you extend our invitation on Zoom, please? Yes, if members of the public wish to speak on this item, please raise your hand in Zoom or send a chat to the meeting host. And I see no takers online. Okay. And I see none here in chambers, so let's come back to council for any additional questions or comment. Council Member Flaherty and then Council Member Piedmont Smith. A brief note. Um, We've discussed this before, and, and I appreciate the, the increase, uh, in particular, to the clerk's salary this year, uh, though I remain of the opinion that both the uh, clerk, city clerk, and the head of the council office um, are department heads and should be compensated accordingly. So I, I look forward to uh, conversations on that front in the future. But again, I appreciate the step up this year. Thank you. Council Member Piedmont Smith. I was going to say the same thing. Thank you. Thank you. Additional comments? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll on Ordinance 2326? Sims? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Scambalori? Yes. Rallo? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Smith? Yes. Volan? Abstain. Flaherty? Yes. And Rosenbarger? Yes. That passes 801. Thank you all. Madam President, I move that rules 2324 be introduced and read by the clerk by title and synopsis only. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor of the motion to introduce, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes. Madam Clerk, will you please read for us? Ordinance 2324, an ordinance fixing the salaries of officers of the police and fire departments for the city of Bloomington, Indiana, for the year 2024. The synopsis is as follows. This ordinance sets the minimum and maximum salary rates for all sworn fire and police personnel for the year 2024 in accordance with council approved Council approved collective bargaining agreements. Um, your due pass recommendation on Amendment 1, or I guess it was an adoption, was 900, and for Ordinance 2324 as amended was 801. Thank you. I move that Ordinance 2324 be adopted. Thank you. Second. Okay. Ms. Kate. Thank you. Uh, so for this final salary ordinance 2324, uh, this is for public safety employees. Uh, you had received a memo earlier from Ms. Fields on uh, the details of this, and there have been uh, just an update or two that I want to mention. Um, uh, but uh, just as a reminder, uh, this adds a new position for fire and changes the title of another, specifically the assistant uh, chief changed to assistant chief of administration and planning to differentiate salaries uh, in the contract um, uh, there. Uh, oh, hang on, wait, I, yes, to differentiate, sorry, to differentiate the position from the uh, added assistant chief of operations. That's the new uh, position. The other one is the title change. Um, and to better reflect their duties. So there was that change. The base salary for firefighters going into 2024 is covered by the collective bargaining agreement with the city, and that's a 2% increase. Um, but as amended, this ordinance uh, will reflect the equivalent of a $5,000 pay increase for those firefighters who are covered under the collective bargaining agreement. So initially, and as with this last year, we had, uh, um, wanted to bring them up to 5% through a kind of uh, retention payment. And uh, instead, this reflects a $5,000 payment. So we'd actually work to a, a slightly higher percentage than that, I think. Um, but that's what you're seeing reflected in the, uh, in the ordinance now. So um, anyway, and uh, I think that's probably it in terms of things that you haven't already seen. and. Uh, read through, but I'm happy to try to answer other questions. And I know that um, uh, later there's a, an amendment coming up on this. With respect to police, um, this reflects a non-certified uh, probationary police officer starting pay. 
Um, and so that will increase by $5,000. And you see the range in here uh, for the pay for that position. Oh, I'm sorry, that's for certified uh, probationary police officers, that range. Um, but the non-certified uh, starting pay will increase by $5,000. Um, police uh, covered by the collective bargaining agreement and supervisory sergeant pay will uh, receive a 2.8% increase in base salary. And then other personnel within the police department will get the 5% increase. Uh, like non-union and AFSCME employees, eligible police and fire personnel will receive uh, an additional $500 uh, payment, bonus payment this year. So I think that is actually it for both uh, fire and police in terms of calling out um, highlights. But again, happy to try to answer questions. Uh, and I know that there is an amendment that has been proposed. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there questions before we go to amendments? Seeing none, let's go to Amendment 1. Madam Chair, oh. Amendment. Sorry? Oh, we were going to do Amendment oh, 1. Oh, I was going to move the amendment, but OK. Oh. And, uh, Madam President, I move Amendment 1 to Ordinance oh, 2324. Second. OK. Um, so this amendment uh, was prepared at the request of the administration to provide employees of the fire department, certain employees of the fire department with additional compensation in the form of retention pay and to facilitate paying additional pay. So it replaces the $500 bonus with retention pay of $5,534 for firefighters first class, $5,555 for chauffeurs, and $5,598 for captains. Thank you. Is there anything additional from the administration on this amendment? I just to note that this is the $5,000 payment I was talking about. The totals that you see that uh, Councilmember Piedmont Smith just uh, read out are slightly above that $5,000 because of the way that we calculated that $5,000 payment. Uh, and I can walk through that calculation if you want, but otherwise, uh, I just wanted to call out since people heard me say a $5,000 number, that's because it's a $5,000 uh, figure that was attached to the adjusted uh, pay in 2023 that I mentioned before to try to bring firefighters up to the equivalent of a 5% uh, increase. Um, so, and again, I'm happy to try to walk through the algebra of this if you want, <laughs> um, or you can spare yourself that pain. So. Any questions regarding Amendment 1? Okay, seeing none, let's go to the public for comment on Amendment 1 to Ordinance 2324. Uh, for those in chambers who would like to offer comment, please approach the podium. Mr. Lucas, can you extend our invitation on Zoom? Yes, if any members of the public wish to speak to this amendment, please raise your hand in Zoom or send a chat to the meeting host to let us know you'd like to speak. online okay. and I'm not seeing any here in chambers so let's come back to council then any questions or any final comment on amendment one to ordinance 2324 council member Piedmont Smith yeah I will just say that I'm very pleased to see uh, this amendment um, I know that the fire department has been struggling with retention of firefighters so um, it's it's great to recognize their hard work and try to um, convince them to, to stay on board with our uh, first class rated um, fire department here in Bloomington through this retention pay increase. Thank you. Additional comment? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll on Amendment 1 to Ordinance 2324? Councilmember Piedmont Smith? Yes. Scambalori? Yes. Rallo? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Smith? Yes. Volan? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Rosenbarger? Yes. And Sims? Yes. That passes 9-0. Thank you, everyone. And that takes us to Amendment 2. Madam Chair, Amendment 2. And is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Councilmember Volan, would you care to present? Thank you. Yes, uh, this is a sorry. This is a 
a very straightforward and pragmatic proposal, uh, which I've mentioned before, but it didn't seem to have takers until uh, the budget process began late in August and September. Um, we have currently 84 of 105 positions of sworn officers filled in the police department. Um, we know historically that there are, uh, there's a very low chance that we're gonna be able to fill 20 police positions in one year, or frankly in many years, net to increase our net position. We have to take into account retirements and uh, uh, resignations. So what this does is it says those 20, 21 positions, take some of them and increase the pay of the remainder, of the remaining uh, officers who exist, or rather of the, of the sworn officer lines that exist. Um, just to give you a sense of uh, scale, uh, the um, current salary, if the current salary is $68,000 for a first year officer with benefits, it's a total of around $86,000. If you divide up uh, 10 positions at 86,000 each among the remaining 95 positions, that would roughly work out to about $9,000 an officer. Um, that would mean that in 2024, a one-year officer at BPD would make 77, a senior officer would make 80,000. Um, and uh, this would make it the most competitive or at least tied for the most competitive in the county. Um, the sheriff's office numbers have been released and uh, in 2024, a one-year officer will make 73, I'm rounding, a three-year officer will make 76 and a half, an eight-year officer will make almost 80, a 25-year officer would make 87. So it's not quite as competitive as the sheriff's grid is, but the point being, uh, with the salary we're paying now, we have no hope of hiring enough people to fill 21 positions. We've never done that in the 20 years I've been here. At that, we've never increased by a net greater amount than a, a, a handful, two to five maybe. Uh, why fund 10, 15, 20 positions that won't get filled next year? Make a permanent increase to the salaries of the remaining officers by cutting positions you know you can't fill. So that's all this says is that, and frankly, I'm agnostic as to the number. If some people want to make it 15, we could increase the salaries or the remainders by more. If we only want to increase it by five, take, take five officers away. I don't really care. I'm just saying, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm asking the question, why are we funding 20 positions that we know we can't fill and just paying overtime? Let's do a common sense thing. Happy to answer questions. I would like to hear the administration's opinion on it. Thank you. Let's go to the administration. Would the administration like to respond? Uh, we oppose this amendment. Uh, I'm also uh, ready to ask uh, Deputy Chief Scott Oldham to join. He, I, I think he's available online. Um, we have worked very hard and continue to work very hard to support our police department. Kalia accredited, very proud of what they do. Um, we do not believe it is appropriate to reduce the funded positions of 105. Um, we continue and have kept that goal in place and continue to pursue it. Uh, we also would have great concern about the sustainability of uh, moving different, uh, of changing, changing salaries in that way that the budget simply would not support. If we were to reach those higher numbers, would take substantial budget adjustments and, and revenue that we do not have identified for that. Um, I would uh, also just note, of course, we are in a, a, a um, well-negotiated, voted uh, police union contract, which was just done with the support of the council to increase that substantially and agreed upon that uh, multi-year agreement. And we continue to work hard to make that all uh, come to pass. I don't know if uh, Deputy Chief Oldham, I see you there. Uh, he may want to comment on this as well, but thanks, we do oppose the amendment. Chief Oldham, Deputy Chief Oldham. Hi, Deputy Chief Oldham, Police Department. Um, we think it's very important that we maintain our numbers at 105. Uh, the officers most certainly need a raise so that we can reach parity with other agencies, uh, but compromising the number of officers that are available for us to hire uh, is something that we we would oppose simply because 
of call volume because it continues to rise and we're going to do everything we can to fill those positions with the appropriate people. Uh, we would not want to be limited to only procuring a certain number instead of going all the way to what we're allowed. Thank you, Deputy Chief Holder. Anything else from the administration before we go to council questions? Okay. Let's come to council. Oh, council Member Rollo. Uh, Mayor Hamilton, I wanted to ask, if this were amendment were to pass, would it translate into salary increases? In other words, would you use it for that purpose or would you not? If the amendment were to pass, uh, the amendment would reduce the personnel, uh, I gather, um, uh, available to hire. It would really be up to the next administration to decide what to do with the revenue. I would note, I didn't mention, I think the overtime has been mentioned. We do use uh, unused 100 figure, uh, 100 um, uh, funds uh, to, for, for covering overtime too, which is important. But it would be up to the next administration, I think, on how to handle that. Council Member Rowland. Yes, of course, I have a number of questions, starting with Chief Oldham. Um, how is it that you expect, well, maybe I should start with, uh, in the next year, how many officers net do you believe that the department is capable of hiring? Well, to be honest with you, thank you for the question. There's no way for me to be able to predict. Um, we have a recruiting hiring specialist that's joined the team. Uh, we have internal people that are working hard on this. Um, yeah, so for me to be able to tell you we're going to hire two or 20 or however many, I can't tell you. It all depends on what we can get to apply as we continue to maintain our standards. Uh, there has been some increase here recently, and we're getting ready to run a couple other processes that the, the Captain Pedigo heads up. Uh, so to actually give you those numbers, Councilman, I wish I could, but I simply can't predict that. Well, when you say increase, are you saying increase in applicants or an increase in hires? Increase in the number of people who are applying to become officers. Okay. Um, in your experience on the VPD, how many net officers have ever been hired in one year, ever? I really couldn't tell you that because it's varied greatly over the years. I can tell you that when I went through, we had seven in the FTO program at once, which was followed again by another seven right behind us. Uh, and I, I came in mid-year. So if that tells you anything, there was a hiring class before mine. What, what year was that, by the way? That was 90. In 1990? Right, and we've had those repeated over the years. Okay, well, I mean, you do recall that in uh, the first eight years of the Cruzan administration, he uh, declared that there would be a net two increase in police officers every year, and my understanding was that it was all the department could do to get net two. Um, do you have any reason to believe that that kind of, I mean, this is, we're in a much more difficult market now. Uh, is there a realistic, uh, uh, idea with uh, knowing uh, that our salaries are not as competitive, that is there a realistic prospect of the department hiring 10 people next year, 10 net new officers? Oh, I would imagine there's a realistic proposition of that, yes. Okay. I've got more questions, but I can hold them for others. Okay. Additional round one questions. Council Member Sims and Council Member Piedmont Smith. Are these questions for the sponsor? Author. Yes, related to Amendment uh, 2. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> and I do have a question. I think part of the terminology of the amendment was unfillable positions. Um, and I think uh, last year this body supported and uh, uh, funded a recruitment specialist. So it's been, you know, a, a year or so, maybe a little less. Um, I will also note that the consultants in the past recommended, and I want to say, uh, I can't remember, 119 or 120 positions, but this body limited that to 105, and I think that was a reasonable number. So I guess understanding that we've not had the recruitment specialist very long, and he's getting into it, um, the climate, I think, overall climate, financial, and, and of the city is changing. How do you see these as being unfillable positions? Uh, thank you for the question. Well, first of all, 
Um, while uh, Chief Oldham has uh, uh, in not, does not have data to provide us, I don't know uh, if anyone in the administration or anywhere else can provide us. Uh, I mean, it, at, in his best recollection, when he started in 1990, uh, the police department hired seven and then seven. Let's say it was 14 in one year. That's the most anyone can cite. That leaves seven positions that are going to waste. Um, so uh, the, combine that with, uh, I mean, and that's, that's the best case scenario. There's been no evidence that we've been able to hire uh, a net number of new, position, of new officers at anywhere near that rate. Uh, add to that the bottleneck that is the Indiana Law, Law Enforcement Academy, the only academy in the state where we can train new officers. We're not going to get uh, already trained officers to come work for us at this salary. They have much better options elsewhere. Uh, uh, you know, from a, from a financial point of view, we've heard that testimony time and time again from the police union. So uh, I don't think it's up to me to prove that uh, uh, we, you know, I mean, it's, I think it's up to the administration to prove that they um, can hire 21 officers. I mean, the fire department is much, it's much easier task for them to hire new recruits. Um, and they've been able to hire that many. But we have stringent standards. We have the academy to think about that we can't get the state to uh, widen it so that we can get people trained earlier. No one can show me that they're going to fill 20 positions net in the next five years, let alone in the next one. Why are we paying overtime instead? Is, that, is, is paying overtime really a better way uh, to use those hundred line dollars than just raising the salaries of those who remain? Rhetorical question, I guess. I mean, that's, that's, why, I, that's why I'm proposing this. Did you want to follow up, Council Member? I did have one more. Um, if, in fact, this amendment passed, does that, in fact, reduce the funded positions to 95? It doesn't, Mo it doesn't do. Sorry. Moving forward. Y yes. On the other hand, again, in 2004, we had 84 lines. Mayor Cruzan said we're going to increase by two a year. We did that for, for eight years. We went to 100. That was what he declared in 2004, and it, and it happened. Uh, and during that time, we found that it was, generally speaking, a challenge to keep up that rate. They certainly couldn't have hired at a greater rate. And that was at a time when we didn't have the competitive salaries situation that we have now. So, I mean, uh, what, what I think is untrue is uh, an assertion the mayor made about, uh, or rather, I don't understand his, his point. Um, whatever the police's budget is right now, it's going to stay that way. It's just going to pay fewer officers, but it's going to pay them more. It's going to pay them a competitive salary with competitive benefits that will be competitive with the sheriff's office and more competitive in the rest of the state. I mean, the next mayor can then say, we're going to add two officers in 2024. We're going to add two officers in 2025, like we did before. Because I've been hearing us complaining about not being able to staff these positions for years. We haven't been at full capacity for years. Who cares if, if uh, we get to, I mean, at least this way, we'll get there. Sooner than we will doing the same thing and hoping that it'll turn out differently. Council Member Piedmont Smith and Council Member Flaherty. Um, so how many officers do we have currently? Can, maybe that's a question for Deputy Chief Oldham or Council Member Wolin, if you know. Four who are currently employed. Eighty-four. But if, Mr. If, if Chief Oldham, is that right? That is correct. To the best of my recollection, that is correct. Okay, so we're down twenty-one based on what's funded currently. Um, so then, uh, my question uh, for the sponsor of the amendment is: um, To can you please address the question of sustainability? as a fiscal sustainability of this proposal if 
So if we, um, if the proposal passes, we, and then if, if the next mayor decides to take those cost savings and increase the salaries of existing officers outside of the union agreement, um, what will happen once we've hired 10 more officers and then we would need a significant increase in the police budget at that point. Um, can you address the sustainability issue? Uh, again, I don't understand how this is unsustainable. Literally, let's just, what is the uh, total amount proposed for police? 17 million? I forget the number now. You just take that number and divide it among fewer officers. The number, the total budget doesn't change, but the officer's compensation improves. Uh, if we, um, if the city government, whoever is we, uh, the council and mayor, decide that 105 is the right number, and we start paying, we, we have, let's say by the end of 2024, we have 95, then to keep hiring, we're going to have to find a lot more money to hire at that new uh, increased level of pay. I will Additional be happy. Officers. I'm so sorry. Oh, I, I, I will be happy to come back and admit my error the day that I see uh, this city hire net 10 new officers in one year. Um, Yes, you're right. If we do this in 2024, if the mayor and the council decide we really need 10 more officers next year, that will make a much larger police budget. My amendment is based on the knowledge that that's never happened and that no one can show that it will. Everyone is wishing, or everyone you know, who is in a favor of 105 is wishing that it would be true. I'm trying to be pragmatic. I'm saying, uh, you know, like, we know that even with this amendment, we're not going to be far and away the highest compensation for police in the state. We're not going to suddenly attract a bunch of lateral moves from other departments. Uh, what I imagine is that we reduce 95, we pay everybody better, and then the next mayor, what I would recommend to the next mayor is try to start doing what happened 20 years ago, add two officers a year. Plan to add it. Because the mayor announced it in 2004, everyone had that to look forward to. The council looked forward to it, expected it. The police could expect it. At least we were making an effort. No one else has made another proposal to get to 105. We would, what would we have to cut in order to get to 105 right now? To, to what, would we have to, what would we have to raise a salary to and what department would we have to cut in order to get there? Again, this is pure pragmatism. I'm kind of agnostic either way. You could cut more positions and raise people even higher. You could cut fewer and raise them a little bit less. But what are we doing? Wasting our time on 10 positions that are not going to get filled next year. I, again, I welcome any evidence, hard evidence, to show that we're capable of hiring 20, 10 officers, let alone 20, in one year. Thank you. Councilmember Flaherty? Thank you. Um, two questions. First of all, Councilmember Boland, you've mentioned several times that why should we pay overtime? We should just pay people more. But if the numbers aren't increasing and we're still short-staffed based on current staffing protocols, paying people more doesn't change the fact that you would still have to pay overtime, right? We'd still have to pay overtime. Like it doesn't, I guess to me it seemed like you were making an assertion that uh, reallocating some of these funds to pay current officers more will mean that we don't have to pay overtime, but I think that's mistaken. Was I misunderstanding you? I mean, I don't have, uh, I understand the question. Um, I don't have uh, off the top of my head the amount that the department paid in overtime last year. I don't know if Chief uh, Oldham has that, that statistic handy, but um, Let's say that we reduce by 10 officers and send eight or nine positions and fund uh, eight or nine positions worth, give those dollars to the, re the other officers, and then save one or two officers' salary behind for the extra overtime. Uh, there's a way to redo it. I mean, this isn't 
Uh, Chief Oldham, do you have the statistic for um, overtime last year? No, I apologize. I didn't didn't pull that off the computer this afternoon. Do you have a rough idea, like how much you're paying in overtime, just a ballpark figure? I couldn't even begin to hazard. I don't want to lead you astray with the number. Well, so, uh, I mean, uh, that's an issue, but you would balance it in some way. It's not the, a big issue. Available. Okay. Yeah. It, I mean, I would say that we would still be better off uh, with officers who are less tired working fewer extra hours than having them run ragged, relatively speaking. Uh, I don't care how you divvy up the 10 officers' positions. Do whatever it takes. Do more for uh, benefits. Do, you know, put a little bit to, to uh, overtime. But the basic idea still stands. The second question, if that's okay, I'll follow up. Which is that, um, of course, this cut or proposed change to the number of uh, funded officer positions does not actually reallocate the money. That's, we don't have that authority or power. It would be up to the mayor. So um, I guess my question is actually, um, is this not already possible even without the amendment? In other words, couldn't the administration, this administration, or more, more practically the next administration, take some of the unspent salary dollars that are budgeted and give at least temporary increases in pay uh, to um, current officers as essentially a, a limited time bonus. Like, I, I don't think this, not only does this amendment not accomplish, not able to accomplish because we don't have the power to accomplish what you're trying to accomplish, but moreover, I'm looking to confirm that the administration already has this power. This amendment isn't necessary to give them that power. Well, that's not true. I mean, they, the administration has to pay the salary that's negotiated. Yeah, you're saying that, I mean, they only could give it as a bonus instead of a raise, but that sends the wrong message. Uh, a raise says we're permanently committing to this higher salary. It's the kind of thing that people would move here for. A permanent raise. Yeah, I mean, I don't, yeah. well, I mean, again, I'm just trying to be practical, but uh, I think that that's what it. would attract people, yeah. Thank you. Additional round one questions. If not, I'll take a turn. So, uh, this question is, is directed to um, Deputy Chief Oldham or to the administration or both. Um, Council Member Volan has said that, that he is not particularly married to the number 10, uh, reducing from 105 to 95, that that number could be five, that number could be 20. Is there a number at which this amendment becomes acceptable or more acceptable to you, or do you feel this amendment is simply not, not the best way forward at this point? or Mayor Hamilton here in person. Um, we do not oppose, we, we would oppose an amendment of any number. Look, part, we're incredibly proud of our police department. I, I contest, uh, I think we have a great police department that is attractive for many people to, to join. We've been doing a lot over the last several years, uh, mentioning recruitment, mentioning housing. We have 17 officers who are now doing the rental assistance, which is worth, uh, $9,000 a year rental assistance. We have uh, an additional major housing assistance coming. We are continuing to recruit. We're very proud of our, our group and we want, to, we want to send that signal. I personally don't think it's a positive signal to say we're reducing our number goal any amount. We've, we've had this discussion before uh, and, and felt it's important to say we want 105 officers in this city and we're committed to that. Uh, we have done a lot of things to uh, adjust and respond, and as you know, together we made a major increase in compensation, um, which we did together with revenue to pay for it. I do not take lightly the idea that we would increase salaries that we do not have a plan to sustain as we grow more officers. Because if your goal is to grow more officers, which we all want to do, we don't have the revenue to sustain it at the, at the proposal that you've made. So, we think we're in a good position. We have a lot of, uh, of things underway and recommend that we continue that way. We have a great police department. We have a very strong 2024 budget. We've made a number of changes in the budget and we encourage you to support it as is. Deputy Chief Oldham, did you have comments, a response as well? 
Well, I think I would just echo what the mayor said, because we are concerned that as the city continues to grow in population, our call volume continues to rise and the ability to recruit up to that 105 is very, very crucial. Uh, and while I appreciate the amendment from Councilman Bolin and the consideration, we definitely need to have those 105 and the ability to recruit to that level. Thank you. Round two question. Council member Piedmont Smith, then Rollo, then Bolin. So the, uh, I think this is a question for Council Member Volan. Um, the uh, salaries of um, most BPD officers are um, in a contract negotiated with their union. So how, I, I don't understand how uh, an increase um, could be, and maybe this is actually a question for, uh, uh, for um, Corporation Council, Kate, um, how uh, is it legally possible for the city to increase salaries, even though that's not in the contract agreement, or would we have to reopen that contract and would the city have to renegotiate? Corporation Council, Beth, Kate, thank you for the question. Uh, I was wondering about that myself. I think that we probably would have to go back to the contract. Uh, we do have a contract that's been negotiated for a certain rate of pay uh, and certain percentage increases. So we would probably have to do some additional work uh, with that contract now, how much opposition we would necessarily get from folks about increases in their salary. Uh, I don't know, but there are obviously bigger picture questions here about uh, that contract and you're hearing from Deputy Chief Oldham uh, about um, concerns about reducing the numbers that this would reflect in, uh, in long-term sustainability. So, uh, so I wouldn't expect that to just uh, be a straightforward or easy path. I think we'd be going back into some further negotiations. We do have a contract that is set and it's of recent vintage, so. Does that contract include the goal of 105 sworn officers? Do you know? Uh, I, well, do you know, I mean, I, I honestly, I would take, take a look back at the language of the contract to see if there's any reference to that particular number. Um, but, uh, so let me get back to you on that, actually. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. Council Member Roller. Yes, my question is uh, for Deputy Chief Oldham. I just wanted to confirm, um, it's already been made, mentioned by Council Member Sims that the consultant report advocated 120 officers. Uh, we, we, we have a goal for 105, but the consultant placed the number at 120, and that's without annexation. Is that correct? If memory serves, that's correct, somewhere in that neighborhood, 120. Okay, thank you. Council Member Volan? Yes. Uh, Chief Oldham, uh, can you tell me how many sworn officers were employed by the city in, or rather in the past eight years, what is the maximum number of sworn officers that have been employed by the city? I can't tell you that at this point. I'll have to get back with you on it. I simply don't have those numbers with me. Mr. Mayor? I know, I know in my tenure, we, I think we actually hit 100 at one point, we're 99. I know we had at some point in the last eight years uh, okay. uh, in terms of employed sworn officers. Well, I mean, uh, what a dramatic uh, difference now that we're down 16 from our peak in this administration. Uh, I'm, uh, how many officers have left in the last year net and how many have been hired? Chief Oldham. Again, Councilman, I'm sorry, I can't give you an exact number on that, I don't know. Okay, well, I mean, the time for this vote is now. Uh, does no one in the administration have this basic uh, census count of the police? We, we, this amendment was just introduced very recently. We've obviously had months to prepare this budget. We've been happy to share any information and respond to any questions that you've had. We will continue to try to do so. We, we, certainly, we certainly agree that it's difficult to hire police officers right now. That's true across the country. It's true here. We're working very hard to do it. I don't think this amendment will help us. Clearly. Thank you. Additional round two questions. 
Seeing none, let's go to the public for comment on Amendment 2 to Ordinance 2324. Uh, here, if you're here in chambers, please go ahead and approach the podium. Uh, Mr. Lucas, could you please extend our invitation on Zoom? Yes, if members of the public would like to comment on this amendment, please use the raise hand feature uh, to let us know. You can find the raise hand button in your control bar under the reactions tab or the more tab. You can also send a chat to the meeting host to let us know you'd like to speak. Let's begin here in chambers. If you would, please share your name for the record and then you'll have three minutes. Thank you, Fred. Mary, Eric Spoonmore, Greater Bloomington Chamber of Commerce. Um, I appreciate the spirit of Mr. Volan's amendment, although it was a bit of a surprise. I was not expecting that coming in here today. And as the president of the chamber, I get paid to pay attention to everything that you guys are doing, especially as it relates to public safety. Um, I think that this particular amendment um, is difficult because there needs to be a lot more public input on this. There's a lot of implications to reducing the number of police officers in a budget. Uh, speaking as a former elected official myself in charge of budgets, I know how difficult it is to get positions back after you have uh, eliminated them from, uh, from, from a budget. And so I think that needs to have some consideration. Uh, would like to learn more about how uh, my members feel about this. I would imagine council members who are elected would like to know more about how your constituents feel about this, lowering the number of police officers. I appreciate Mr. Flaherty's remarks, appreciate uh, Mr. Sims' remarks and uh, the administration's remarks. Um, so I would urge the council to, uh, to not support this tonight. Uh, give this a lot more thought before we look at uh, reducing the number of sworn police officer positions. But again, appreciate Mr. Volan's uh, thoughtfulness and, and, and thinking about these things. We need to be thinking about these things as a community. So thank you. Thank you. Mr. Lucas, do we have anyone on Zoom? No, not that I see. Okay, and I'm not seeing anyone else here in chambers. So let's come back to council for additional questions. Council member Piedmont Smith. Yes, uh, Council Member Volan, have you reached out to the FOP or the rank and file officers or their leadership about this? I have, and or at least they've reached out to me, and their reaction is uh, if it's simply a bonus, uh, they would not find it satisfactory. They wanted to see raises. Uh, and I saw this as the most effective way to make their salaries competitive than anything anybody else has proposed. Short, that wouldn't cut some other part of the budget. Um, you know, I take that the mayor is not inclined to use it for that purpose, so for that reason alone, uh, you know, it's probably not going to fly, but um, the, the bottom line is this council does, in fact, have the power to make that happen. Unfortunately, that power is nuclear. We would have to hold up the budget or cut big parts of the budget in order to make the administration comply. That is the kind of thing that this council is typically not preferred to do. Uh, but again, it's still a pragmatic thing and I don't blame the union for believing that um, it should be a raise that advertises that yes, we're gonna be paying at this level from now on and it's not gonna be, again, if you're trying to attract lateral moves, people who are already trained at the academy, who worked at another department. Uh, if, if, if I were them, I would want that kind of reliability. I don't want to know that, well, they gave us a $9,000 bonus this year, but who knows if it'll come next year. And I moved for this salary. I mean, it's, it's not an unreasonable thing for employees who, are, who we want to commit to a community to want in return. Member Volan, uh, so were they agreeable to reducing the number um, of officers from 105 to 95 in our official salary ordinance? If it was a raise, yes. And that was from the leadership of the FOP? That's from uh, Jeff Rogers and uh, I don't know that Paul Post, I can read some of what he said, if that helps. Okay. All right. Um, he did say that uh, 
The short-term fix will provide a message to the remaining officers that their hard work has not gone unnoticed and also raise the salary lines to stay competitive. We need to estimate the quick hires of certified officers, which in turn is the only way to have a chance to fill many of the open spots next year. Thank you. Additional questions? Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Corporation uh, Council Kate. Answer uh, Councilmember Piedmont Smith's question from before about whether the FOP contract mentions the number of officers. I don't see a mention of that in here. Uh, obviously, the contract's implicated if we're going to change pay uh, because that's been negotiated, but I don't see the 105 number uh, mentioned in the contract. I may have missed it, but I don't see it. Thank you. Thank you. Additional questions? Final comment then on Amendment 02. Council Member Rolla, then Council Member Sandberg. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Councilmember Volan for an intriguing effort. Um, it's a very interesting discussion. Um, I'm, I might be favorable, but we will have a new administration within a few months. Um, I'm hoping that the salaries of police will be a priority and, and increased uh, in order to be competitive uh, next year. Uh, I'm very hesitant to lower our goal of 105 officers, knowing um, especially that we will likely need more as per the consultant report and more still uh, if annexation ex increases area, city area. Um, so I won't be supporting this this evening, but I'm grateful he brought it forward for the discussion. Thanks. Council Member Sandberg. Then well, thank you. I appreciate the good intentions here. I think uh, it is very clear that I have been sounding the alarm for several years now about the state of our police department and the uh, short staffing issues that, to me, uh, are going to require a lot of effort. Um, salaries, of course, and I've said this when we've had our many discussions about the collective bargaining and uh, to be competitive, which, of course, is something we all need to consider. But this, to me, as well-intentioned as it is, it's not as well thought through as it needs to be for the consequences. And it caps us. It limits us. It puts a hard number. It cuts us off at the knees, literally. Uh, and that, to me, is too slippery of a slope, even in my advocacy for doing everything we possibly can to recruit, retain, and to get our staffing numbers up. A couple of things that were said that, oh, there's low chance, there's no hope. This is, seems to me a very cynical approach to something that, again, I have hope, as, as critical as I have been of this administration and how it has handled the police. I do have hope that a new administration coming in will actually be able to institute some things and we can start to see a, a, a move. But the sustainability that's been brought up by several of my colleagues in this discussion and, and the mayor himself, um, the fact that the unused salaries are going for overtime, that is not a choice. That is a necessity because of how short-staffed we are now. And so even though 105 officers may be very aspirational, it may seem impossible that we're ever going to get to that number again. It is critical that we do, because I believe the studies that said we actually need 120. So even 105 are not enough in my humble opinion. And for us to then, just because times are hard and things are difficult, we're giving up and saying, ah, oh, let's just move the needle back to 95. Um, again, what uh, Mr. Spoomore said about how difficult it is to get numbers up once you've cut them from a budgetary standpoint. Um, I, I just think this is uh, not the way to go. Um, and again, I applaud Councilmember Volan. I know your intentions are good. My intentions are, are similar. And what do we do? We've got a crisis. We've got a staffing shortage. And we need to do everything we possibly can. I just can't support this as the way forward. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Sims. Thank you. Um, and I applaud and I'm thankful for Councilmember Volan's intent and efforts as well. Um, a couple of things, uh, sustainability and unfillable, those two terms are bothersome to say the least. Um, I don't believe they're unfillable. I believe we have challenges like every other community or pretty much all other communities, not only throughout the state but across the country. So 
are they unfillable? I don't think so. Do we have challenges? Of course we do. Um, that's the one point. Um, like Council Member Flaherty said, this will not, I don't see it reducing any need for overtime um, as we move forward. Uh, I, I just don't see it. It's not like we reduce the number and all those needs automatically go away. It don't, it don't happen that way. I'd also like to give us uh, our recruitment specialists and our HR staff and some of our administration, including BPD, and more of an opportunity uh, um, to move forward and, and, and maybe hire some more for, or uh, some innovative, we like to use the term innovation, innovative ways to move forward. So I'm looking forward to giving them that opportunity as well. Um, and we had a big debate on uh, after consultant, um, the BPD consultant and the number 120, I do believe was the number. This council, and I'm a part of this body, and I thought we did the right thing, says no, that's not really what we want for the community at this point. And we settled on 105. And of course, there were some other things up in the air. We still weren't sure about annexation. Not so sure, we still are sure about that. Um, and there are some other things and some growth, but I think that's a good number. Um, 95 is just flat out unsustainable, and not only will it will do budgetarily and hamstring moving forward. So um, again, I appreciate the intent and the amendment, um, but I uh, won't be able to support this amendment. Thank you. Additional comments on Amendment 2? Councilmember Volan. Uh, Mr. Spoonmore, who was paying attention two weeks ago, would have noted that I was discussing this idea then, but he did correctly point out that this doesn't have to be the end of the discussion. Certainly, next year's council can take up this idea. It's not an idea that has to expire. Uh, I also want to point out that, uh, you know, with all due respect to the administration, this is not in any way a criticism of the pride that it feels for its police department. I don't think that, that the, the mayor isn't proud of what he's doing. I appreciate the presentation he's made. I'm reacting to what I heard from both sides about the challenges here. But if we're gonna talk about sustainability, do you know what number is less sustainable than 95? 84. We've been hearing time and again that we uh, that, that regardless of the current rate of change, the amount of offers we have here is unsustainable. That we're paying overtime, we're burning people out. But we can't get even the simplest information about the change in the number of officers hired. We don't even know, the mayor estimated that there was one point where we had 100 officers sometime in his administration in the past eight years. But we don't know. And this council is content to not find out content to rest in its beliefs about things rather than look at the data, check the evidence, see the numbers that are plainly in sight. 84 is not sustainable when we know, if, if we're assuming we need 105 and we only have 84, the, the 84 are burning out. If we had 95, they would be less burned out. I get that there are people who want 105. I respect that. But 10 theoretical officers does no one any good. Now, I take that back. There are some people who have asserted that the mere existence of the number is enough to send a signal. I would simply suggest that uh, it's inadequate. Uh, I'm not a cynic. This is not a cynical proposal. And I have experience. I remember exactly the numbers from my first two terms. I, was, I remarked on it at the time. I thought, well, that's interesting. I didn't really know in 2004, can we do that? It was a challenge what we did. I would challenge anyone to go back and check that record. But we were at 100 in 2012, and we never got past 100 through the entire Hamilton administration and the end of the Cruzan administration. We've never had 105 officers, literally never had it. If we were to cut five officers right now, at least we'd be at the strength we were before. So 
So we're going to keep doing what we're doing. You know, th there's another idea, which was we could come up with a more complicated formula. Probably wouldn't make anybody happy. But we could say that this part of the contract says, let's take all the money that's not used this year and that's not paid out to overtime, all the lines that didn't get paid for, and, pay it out, and, and have a formula where we pay it out as a bonus at the end of the year to officers. So at least they can expect that there's going to be some kind of uh, payout in lieu of a formal raise. That should be more doable. That should be something that could be added to a contract. It could be added as a rider. That's not going to be for me to decide. It'll be for the next council to decide. But uh, I feel like there are just a lot of people for very different reasons fooling themselves here. This is a very pragmatic proposal in theory. It's not going to get put into place in practice. Uh, if for no other reason that the administration doesn't want to reopen a contract, I get that. Uh, but we haven't had this conversation, and we needed to have this conversation, and we need to keep having this conversation. I hope the next council will have it. But what good is it to keep burning out the officers we have left uh, when there's no guarantee whatsoever, no hard evidence whatsoever, that anyone who is wishing for 105 can get to it. Thank you. I'd urge support of the amendment. Thank you. Additional final comments on Amendment 2 to Ordinance 2324. Councilmember Piedmont Smith? Yeah, I don't, I don't think we'll get to 105 next year either. <laughs> I think it's a very, very heavy lift. Um, we do have a new recruitment uh, position in HR uh, that's been at it for less than a year, so hopefully uh, that will reap some, some benefits as far as additional hiring. But I, I do understand the reasoning behind Councilmember Volan's amendment. Um, overtime may be reduced because we would be able to recruit more officers more quickly because the salary would be significantly higher um, to get, you know, potentially up to 95. Um, but I, there are too many uncertainties as far as um, how to pay for it long term and uh, what the new administration would actually do with the, the money um, that would be saved by reducing the number of officers. Um, I think this is an idea we should talk about next year um, and, uh, you know, really uh, take some time to, to vet it and, and talk to the FOP and talk to police administration and, um, and see how we can move ahead. Because I, I do agree with Councilmember Volan that we keep doing the same things um, uh, and we're, we're still not filling the officer positions. Although I, I must say Mayor Hamilton had some innovative you know, housing incentives and things, um, but even that, has, those have not really um, led to the gains that we need. So uh, I'm gonna vote against this, but I, I think it's an idea worth exploring again in the future. Thank you. Additional comments? Councilmember Rollo. Yes, just in response to Councilmember Volan, there is no guarantee that the cut in number of officers will manifest in higher salaries. So, um, but it will reduce the number of officers as the goal. And I'm loath to do that. I will keep advocating for higher salaries for the, during the next administration, and I'm hopeful that that will happen. Um, thanks. Councilmember Volan. I appreciate the comment from Council Member Rallo, but I would say you have a chance to raise your salaries right now. Everyone has a chance to do that. We could make it happen if there was collective will to do it. Uh, but in the name of officers that don't exist, that have never existed, there's at least five positions that have never been filled. Literally, we've never been more, over 100. The mayor can't even recall. So it's, let's just take 100 as given. There's at least five positions that are going to waste every year, have for as long as we've had 105. So let's cross that 100 officer bridge when we come to it. Let's get to 100 first and then add positions. Then worry about where the money will come from for the next ones. Let's cross that 95 bridge when we come to it. I just, I find it inexplicable 
I can understand the procedural reasons why people wanted, wanna, wouldn't want to do it. I can understand not wanting to reopen a contract. But if there's a will, there's a way. And there is clearly not a lot of will here. Thank you. Thank you. Additional final comments on Amendment 2 to Ordinance 2324? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll on Amendment 2? Scambalori? No. Rallo? No. Sandberg? No. Smith? No. Volan? Yes. Flaherty? No. Rosenbarger? No. Sims? No. Piedmont Smith? No. Thank you, and that fails 1-8, which brings us back to Ordinance 2324 as amended. So, um, where did we leave off? We had questions. We have, are there any questions on 2324 as amended? Seeing none then, let's go to public comment. If you have comments here in chambers, please approach the podium. Mr. Lucas, can you please invite our comment via Zoom? Yes. Members of the public wish to speak to this uh, salary ordinance, please raise your hand in Zoom or send a chat to the host to let us know you'd like to comment. And let's go ahead and start here in chambers, if you would. Please share your name for the record. And Eric Spoonmore, Greater Bloomington Chamber of Commerce, just here tonight um, on this uh, particular ordinance to reiterate some of my prior remarks concerning the public safety positions uh, that are funded in this budget. Um, I've learned that public safety and security for all is a primary goal for uh, several of you. And so this is an, uh, an admirable goal and one that the chamber is supportive of. Uh, you may recall that the Community Advisory on Public Safety uh, Commission recently reported to the council that violent crime has increased by 24% in our city since 2016. And at the same time, the number of police officers employed by the city has decreased by over 20%. Now, I can't say for certain if there's any correlation between the loss of police officers and the rise in violent crime rates in Bloomington, but I don't think it should be dismissed as coincidence. We urge the city, the Chamber of Commerce urges the city, to do everything within its power to fully staff the number of police officer positions that are funded by this budget. I think we've clarified that's 105. And, uh, and then in parallel, let's also invest in some other non-police mechanisms that can meaningfully curb the violent crime rate in Bloomington that's been trending upward. Uh, at the very least, we'd like to see a plan that outlines the city's expectations and a timeline for a fully staffed police department, which I think addressed some of the concerns that Mr. Volan has. Uh, now, this is just my opinion, but I don't think public safety and security for all um, will be able to be achieved if our violent crime rates continue to increase at the clip that we've seen since 2016. We hope that reducing violent crime will be the number one priority for our elected leaders in the years ahead. And we think a fully staffed police department is just one of the necessary components to making that happen. So that's really all I wanted to say tonight. I do wish um, all of you the best with this budget for next year and hope it provides an appropriate allocation of resources that can, that can accomplish public safety and security for all. We view this as the most important goal for the city. We'll continue to track it and we want to help you achieve it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Lucas, do we have anyone on Zoom? No, not that I see. Okay, and I don't see any further interest in commenting here in chambers, so let's come back to council for any final comments on Ordinance 2324 as amended. <laughs> Seeing none, Madam Clerk, will you, oh, will you please call the roll? Rallo? Yes. Scan Sandberg? Yes. Yes. Voland? No. Flaherty? Yes. Rosenbarger? Yes. Sims? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Scambalori? Yes. 
Thank you. That passes 8 1 0. Madam President, I move that appropriation ordinance 2306 be introduced and read by the clerk by title and synopsis only. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor of the motion to introduce, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? That passes then. Madam Clerk, if you would, please read. Appropriation Ordinance 2306, an ordinance adopting a budget for the operation, maintenance, debt service, and capital improvements for the water and wastewater utility departments of the City of Bloomington, Indiana for the year 2024. This ordinance approved by the Utility Service Board, or synopsis is as follows. This ordinance approved by the Utility Service Board in July of 2023 sets the water and wastewater budgets for 2024. Your due pass recommendation was 900. Thank you. Mr. Kelson, yeah. welcome. Madam President. Oh, I'm sorry. Appropriation Ordinance 2306 be adopted. Second. Thank you. My fault. Mr. Kelson, welcome. Uh, good evening. I'm Vic Kelson, Utilities Director. Uh, I don't have any additional changes since the last uh, time we were together, and I'm happy to answer any questions that uh, you may still have regarding the Utilities Department budget. Okay. Thank you. Are there any questions from Council Members? Council Member Piedmont Smith? Yes, for the benefit of the public, Mr. Kelson, could you summarize the amounts in question for water and wastewater? Summarize the amounts? Yeah, for the budget next year. Uh, there are 20, I think they're 22 million and 28 million, I believe, for the, in some, something like that. It's 50 million total. I didn't have it at the top of my head. Okay, yeah, so. Yeah, water is 22.4 and sewer is somewhere over 28, or right around 28. Thank you. And thank I know you, it's Mr. a little over 50. Okay. Thank you. Additional questions? Seeing none, let's go to public comment then on Appropriation Ordinance 2306. If there's anyone here in chambers who would like to make a comment, please approach the podium. Mr. Lucas, could you please extend our invitation on Zoom? Yes, if there are members of the public that wish to comment on this item, please raise your hand in Zoom or send a chat to the meeting host letting us know you'd like to speak. And I see no takers. Okay, and I'm not seeing anyone here in chambers either. So let's come back to council for any additional questions or for final comment. Council Member Sims. Thank you. Hi, Mr. Kelson. Uh, this, uh, this is just a, a general question, I think, for the public um, and not so much gonna affect this budget, but can you give us your thoughts on long-term sustainability of our water source um, with anticipated growth? Uh, has that been part of you, your discussion with administration, the board, and? Yes, certainly that's no, been I'm something. Sure, I'm sure it has, but I'm, <laughs> I want the public to know that as well. Yes, it has. Um, yeah, presently, our, our, the, the Lake Monroe is capable of producing over 100 million gallons per day of drinking water supply. Uh, we are the only large uh, water user that's taking water from Lake Monroe. Uh, our capacity is 30 million gallons per day. Uh, on average, we, we average somewhere between 15 and 16 million gallons per day over the course of the year with our peak being somewhere in the low 20s. Um, so uh, at this point, we have, we have su sufficient supply to, to continue to support uh, uh, growth uh, in the community for, uh, with our water supply. Uh, what we are seeing, of course, is changes in the water quality as we go forward in time. Uh, in 2017, we started using activated carbon at the water plant as part of our disinfection byproduct management strategy. Uh, at that point, we discovered that uh, the hundreds of taste and odor complaints that we used to get all summer long uh, went to zero for almost five years, and then uh, in each uh, 21 and 22, 2021 and 2022, uh, we had a rash of complaints uh, related to a kind of a, a soil or dirt kind of taste that we were getting. Uh, that comes from uh, algal growth in the lake. Uh, this year, uh, right now, we're experiencing a milder form of that. Uh, 
we have uh, made changes in our process this year um, to try and better manage taste and odor events when they come up. I think we've been uh, partially successful. We haven't completely eradicated it. Um, again, these have been short events that last a couple of weeks. Uh, perhaps um, my concern uh, going forward is uh, if the light continues to change, when are we going to get to the point where we can't manage taste and odor for three months or four months at a time? So uh, during our next uh, next rate case, we're going to be talking more about that, I suspect. Uh, we need to take uh, pay close attention to uh, what it would cost for us to eliminate this issue altogether in the future uh, and see if that's something that we're all willing to pay for. Um, so in the water supply, uh, quantity is not an issue, but uh, I think I've been saying it for a long time that the issue we have with Lake Monroe right now isn't whether we can make whether we can make drinking water, it's just what it will cost. Thank you. Um, one more, and again, uh, I think I'm not the only one up here on the council chambers that get questions from our constituents, um, and this one in particular has to do with uh, leaf removal um, and the program that we've suspended, um, and I don't particularly want to get into that but I'm getting a lot of questions and comments on keeping leaves out of the sewer system and how do we keep the drains open. And so can you share with the public a little bit more about those plans and goals, including use of the street sweepers that I do believe uh, utilities got from public works in order to help facilitate that? So j just so our public can understand and expect some things and I don't have to explain as much in Kroger and Walmart. <laughs> That's great. Um, essentially, if the if with the the elimination of the vacuuming of the leaves uh, by the city, if the public uh, doesn't rake their leaves into the street, uh, it probably won't have any more of an effect on us than it had before. And people weren't supposed to rake their leaves into the streets even when we were vacuuming them. So. Um, uh, so it's all, it's all up to all of us to not put our leaves in a place where they'll end up in the storm drain. And that goes for grass clippings and every, uh, other kinds of yard waste as well. Um, but the fact is that some people will continue to rake their leaves into the street or blow their leaves into the street, or their leaves will be piled at the edge of the yard and then they'll blow into the street because of the wind. Um, we keep a close watch on things. We respond to, to questions that people ask when we get a complaint about a storm drain being blocked. Um, we do have people out and about uh, monitoring all of this as much as we can. Uh, whenever there's a rain event coming, uh, we do definitely get out and, and redouble our efforts to make sure that uh, when there's rain in the forecast, we're out there making sure that the, the grates are, are uncovered. But uh, if there are more leaves blowing into the street this year, we'll, we'll obviously find that out. Um, the, street sweeping program that we're embarking on at, at CBU is oriented towards uh, keeping debris out of our stormwater system. Uh, that we will begin executing that program next year uh, in 24. Uh, we're doing a study to uh, design optimal routes for running sweepers specifically for the purpose of managing our, uh, our storm sewer system. So uh, that's that's what's going on now. We will be implementing that next year. So in all probability, you'll see us out doing more uh, uh, sweeping at leaf season, certainly, to make sure that we're not getting a lot of leaves in the, in the inlets. Thank you, Mr. Cousin. I appreciate it. And I'll leave you with the thought of educating the public moving <laughs> forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Additional questions? Council Member Rollo. Uh, Director Kelson, um, this I had a couple questions as a follow-up to Councilmember Sims. One, one is, um, what is the peak at maximum use of the water treatment? In other words, how much spare capacity do we have at peak times? Oh, the, the, actually, the, that peak has actually been going down, uh, if anything, over the last uh, uh, six to ten years. Uh, in general, our water use has been more or less flat, very slowly growing uh, overall, which 
I think reflects that this is a, a community that does try to conserve water. A lot of people don't put much water on their lawns. Um, and uh, there's been a lot of construction, but new construction has new plumbing. So I think that's, that's part of what's been going on. Uh, this year, we have not had a day that exceeded 20 million gallons. Um, that's probably because it wasn't as hot a summer uh, as it was last year, when our peak was more like uh, between 20 and 21. Uh, the highest peak we've ever had was actually 22 million, and that was in 2012. Uh, the, the year that the, the most recent plant expansion was completed. So uh, we're not seeing a rapid rise in that, but it's certainly something we pay attention to. Oh, that's good news. Uh, my other question was about, you know, knowing that reservoirs are vulnerable to sil siltation. Um, what, is, what, do you, what do you reckon is the longevity of the reservoir? Uh, we don't have the, the data to really give a, a strong answer to that, but I think it's certainly... Um, Certainly, 50 to 100 years, it's going to be, in terms of volume, I don't think there's going to be an issue that would affect us badly. Uh, certainly, where we are, there's not uh, a lot of siltation at the intake. We, we happen to know that because we had divers down there uh, last summer, uh, and they didn't see a lot of siltation at the intake. That said, if you look upstream into that sort of four bay region that's east of the causeway on 446, uh, that has been seeing uh, more significant siltation. Uh, we are supporting uh, the Lake Monroe Water Fund and the Friends of Lake Monroe in this budget. Uh, and one of the things that I know both those organizations really want to do is a bathymetric study to look at how much siltation has happened and where uh, in Lake Monroe. And I think that's a project that's very likely to happen uh, uh, in the near future. So that would give an estimate in terms of It'll give us a much better estimate so of how fast the lake is filling in, yes. Okay. All right, great. Thank you. Thank you. Additional questions? Or final comments? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll on Appropriation Ordinance 2306? Sandberg? Yes. Smith? Yes. Bolin? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Rosenbarger? Yes. Sims? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Scambalori? Yes. And Rollo? Yes. That passes 9 0. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Kelson. Madam President, I move that uh, appropriation ordinance 2307 be introduced and read by the clerk by title and synopsis only. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor of the motion introduced, please <coughs> indicate by saying aye. Any opposed? That passes then. Madam Clerk, if you would, please read. Appropriation Ordinance 2307. Appropriations and tax rates for Bloomington Transportation Corporation for 2024. Your due pass recommendation is 800. <laughs> that appropriation ordinance 2307 be adopted. Second. Thank you. And do we have anyone from the administration who'd like to comment? Or from transit? Mr. Connell is via Zoom. He should be able to uh, enable his video. There we go. Mr. Connell, welcome. Good evening, John Connell, General Manager, Bloomington Public Transportation Corporation. Uh, I'm glad to answer any questions anyone may have. Nothing's changed since the, the last meeting. Okay. Are there any questions from council? Council member Piedmont Smith. Yes, Mr. Connell, just for the benefit of the public, could you please remind us of the total budget uh, request? You know, I apologize. I, I just got back from a trade show and uh, that's why I'm zooming. I, I don't have uh, the all my paperwork with me. Um, I can pull it. Let me see if I can pull it up uh, quickly. We actually have it on screen now. So Council Attorney Lucas has displayed okay. it. Twenty six point six million. Thank you. Follow Thank you. Question? No. Additional questions on Appropriation Ordinance 2307? 
Seeing none, let's go to public comment then. If you have comments on Appropriation Ordinance 2307, please go ahead and approach the podium. Mr. Lucas, can you extend our invitation on Zoom, please? Yes, if any members of the public wish to speak to this item, please raise your hand in Zoom or send a chat to the host to let us know you'd like to speak. And not seeing any takers. Okay, and I'm not seeing anyone here in chambers, so let's come back to council then for any additional questions. Or final comment on Appropriation Ordinance 2307. Seeing none, Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Smith? Yes. Wollen? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Rosenberger? Yes. Sims? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Scambalori? Yes. Rallo? Yes. And Sandberg? Yes. And that passes 9-0. Thank you. Madam President, I move that uh, appropriation ordinance 2305 be introduced and read by the clerk by title and synopsis only. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor of the motion to introduce, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, that motion passes. Madam Clerk, if you would please read. Appropriation Ordinance 2305, an ordinance for appropriations and tax rates establishing the 2024 Civil City Budget for the City of Bloomington. Your due pass recommendation was 513. Thank you. I move that Appropriation Ordinance 2305 be adopted. Second. Thank you. Are there any further comments from the administration? On Good evening, uh, Jeff Underwood, City Controller. Uh, I'll just make a few brief uh, comments to summarize uh, where we're at tonight. Uh, this uh, shows the final phase of the budget review and approval, uh, where we presented program budgets in late August, and now we've moved to the state mandated forms. Uh, the budget was duly advertised on the state gateway systems uh, 10 days in prior to the public hearing, which was held on 927. And this creates appropriation in ordinance 2305, uh, form four that covers 37 different funds. Uh, the rise total budget excluding utilities and transit is 150.6 million. Uh, this was an increase of 21.2 million or 16.4%. Uh, as noted, uh, we, we will continue to have uh, more than uh, projected reserves um, goal. The goal is 33%. We project that we'll be at 39.2 in the general fund. Uh, summary of the changes in the uh, general fund, there was an increase of $12.114 million. Uh, that was $9.9 .9 million in the council budget for the 5% COLA. Uh, there was 14.6% in the clerk's budget uh, for the clerk's salary uh, change. Uh, there was a slight increase of 14000 uh, uh in the tax caps and then the uh, addition of the CREED expenditures of 12.075 million. Uh, there were two other funds that had changes of uh, the American Rescue Plan Act or ARPA. Uh, we appropriated $7.275 million. And then finally in the digital equity, uh, equity fund, an increase of 15.1,000, uh, 15,000.1. Uh, and that was to increase the uh, digital equity position from part-time to full-time. And thanks to everyone that participated. Thank you for all the hearings and, and questions from the council. And uh, with that, I conclude my last budget presentation. But you're not done yet. So uh, are there questions for Mr. Underwood? You may be finished, so. But in which case, let's go to amend. I believe we have an amendment. Council Member Volan. Amendment one. Please go ahead. Thank you. Well, uh, as I said before, I wanted to know uh, where the creed money was going, if it wasn't going to go into the creed. And I've prepared an amendment that would cut money that uh, uh, because, we, because we don't have many tools, and the only tool to, um, uh, that I have at my disposal is to cut money, as we've talked about before. Um, 
there are a lot of worthwhile uh, things that the administration is proposing with Creed money, but I continue to read the plain reading of the statute, which says in the district, the money should be spent in the district where it was raised. So uh, I want to acknowledge now that at 5.30, a memo came into our mailboxes um, that is from the deputy mayor, Larry Allen, um, where is it? Uh, that goes into some more detail. I'm hoping that uh, that's, that administration will present uh, this memo so we can talk about it. Um, but uh, the fact that it came an hour before makes it hard to really synthesize it. Um, but I mean, I'm happy to reduce the number of cuts uh, if it can be made clear that any portion of it uh, is being spent in the creed. And I believe that the memo does show that there are some dollars that are being spent in the creed. So with that, I'm happy to answer questions. Okay. Would the administration like to respond? I'll be brief. Um, we oppose the amendment. We, uh, I won't repeat in any length what we spoke about a couple weeks ago about the nature of uh, the funds, the, the permission, the direction, in fact, from the state to introduce this into our general fund and, and use them, allowing to use them for any legal purpose. We are, uh, as we've shared with you, a significant list of investments, both of the Creed money and the American Rescue Plan Act money that we think is a very significant major advance for our community in lots of ways that I think will help our residents uh, and help our community move forward and thrive. Um, we did get the amendment, uh, I guess, Friday or whenever that was, we first got access to that. And while we gave you an indication orally uh, a couple weeks ago that certainly substantial amounts of the creed would be used in the Creed districts uh, we, when we could not give a precise number for that. We have tried to provide you with some outline of those issues uh, that we've asked our staff to develop uh, in some detail about the different components of that. I think the, the, the only other point I'll make is um, during the past several years, we have made, we collectively as a community have made very substantial investments in the Creed district. Um, We've referenced the Four Street Garage replacement, uh, which could have all been, which could have used all the Creed money up. We did not use the Creed money for that, but it would be gone if we had done that, and we would be not able to do a lot of these things that we're talking about, but perhaps we would feel good about the use of the Creed. But I think um, our general view is we've together done very good investments in our community in Recover Forward and before. Uh, we have a, a list that we think uh, will advance our community very substantially but it is up to the council to decide whether you want us to, uh, and the next administration, to invest those funds in these categories. Uh, we've shared with them in some length with you, and if there are particular issues about, uh, questions about uh, certain uses, or the heat maps or the other indications, we're happy to do that. I may get some help from some of our cabinet who are standing by, I think. Thanks very much. Thank you. Are there questions for Council Member Boland or for the administration? On Amendment 1. Councilmember Volan? Yeah, I'd like to ask about the memo, so I'm not sure who can speak to it. Um, if Mr. Allen, I, I, don't, I mean, are you the one with the most detail, or will uh, department head? Okay. I'd like to go through the memo. So we'll start with the Safe Streets for All, Planning and Transportation, $2.0 million of Creed money. Uh, I'm trying to read it quickly. Uh, it's a federal grant program that requires a 20% local match. The two million in Creed funds would be used to attract another eight million in federal funding. What specifically is the funding going to pay for? Yeah, so there's, there's a couple elements to this, and I, actually if somebody from Planning and Transportation is on, I, I think that they could speak to all the details of the federal grant. One of the first things that's done, though, is that a safety plan has to be developed, and the, the purpose is really to reduce crashes and reduce dangerous intersections. And as we showed with the heat map, the, the purpose of the heat map is to kind of show where what's going to inform that safety plan, which would ultimately inform the, the safety plan that dictates how we would use those funds. And so in this case, the $2 million would go toward 
Uh, again, it, it's, it's part of the local 20% match to, to get the, so if you look at the heat map, the most significant areas where crashes occur uh, are in the downtown and overlap almost exactly with the downtown creed. So what we would suspect is that while this isn't finalized, this is kind of what we had presented before, which is we don't know for sure because part of this grant application is developing the safety plan and using some of the funds for the safety plan. Uh, but what we would suspect, and even if you scroll down, Mr. Lucas, to the next one, that's kind of the close-up, but the, the whole city, what you can see there is the hottest area is the downtown. And so I think certainly we could expect that 20% of those funds would be concentrated in those intersections to make them safer and to update them under the grant program. Well, I guess the question I went more specifically was, what exactly is the type of correction made to achieve a safer street for all? Is it uh, curb replacement or uh, intersection redesign or what does the like, money get spent on? Yeah, if we, have, if we have somebody from planning and transportation, they'd be the best pre people to answer that. Yes. Let me add, I was um, briefed that our director of planning and transportation had his, I won't go into his medical. He, he may not be disposed to be able to answer this tonight. I, um, I do think it's a wide range of things. Some of you may know better than I do, but but structural changes could be um, uh, intersection changes, even signal changes and others, um, uh, lane changes, that kind of thing. Is the, I, I understand that there is a list of priorities that the planning and transportation staff has uh, got a, a list of the, the most significant intersections. I know that uh, the red dot over there at 3rd and Eagleson, uh, or Swain and Eagleson, was the number two crash site in the county, and that's been repaired, or it's been improved with bollards, but I don't know if that still applies here, because I think the numbers have gone down. I guess what I'm trying to, to figure out is, uh, we get the federal grant money, um, will that money take care of all these problems? Uh, like, I just don't have any sense of of what's going to be done with it, even though I know it's gen what it's generally for. Do you see what I mean? Like, like, is it intersection improvements? Is it lane change? I mean, like, what what's the money going to? All of the above that may change structures, procedures, programs, lights. Uh, I, I think the point that the Planning and Transportation Department would make is that while they would undergo and use a very open public process to identify this and of course there'd be a lot of input on those kinds of things if we get the match i think what they were trying to do is assure that at least 20 percent of that would would be used in the downtown area is their expectation uh, in any kind of process like that and to the extent that your specific concern is will creed dollars be used in the creed district that we the planning and transportation suggests that it's highly likely that at least 20% of any safe streets program would involve uh, that much in the downtown area, which would mean the Creed money used that way. Okay, I'll accept that for now, thank you. Can we go on to the next one? I've got more, but I wanna go through the whole memo. Are there additional questions? Okay, please, Whoop. Council Member Piedmont Smith. Um, I guess uh, 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 an underlying question I had would be um, how much in, so we have two creed, two former creed districts, two pots of money that used to be in creed, downtown and the Thompson site. How much of each is part of the budget proposal? Yeah, or are they just kind of lumped together? Mr. Underwood can best uh, answer that in terms of what the distribution is, although they're both in the general fund at this point. Yeah, I mean, we're tracking it on a combined total. I'd have to go back and look what the split was uh, for that. So um, we originally moved 17.365 million. Uh, the council appropriated 3.061 uh, for the tech center. And then we're proposing an additional 12.075 million tonight. That's a combination of, of those two districts. And how much was in each district when they I, dissolved themselves, I'd have, to go, I'd have to go back and look. I don't, I don't, I don't have that in my notes. I've just got the combined numbers. I actually know this. It's ten and seven, respectively. Ten in the downtown, seven in the Thompson. Okay. 
Um, and of the 10 million, we uh, committed um, three for the, the tech building. Is that right? So it's basically seven and seven. No, that's not right. That was committed no. before this 10 left after the money from the tech building. Of the total amount that, that we drew down. So it's, I, I took the question to be of the 17 million total, which is what was went to the general fund. Three million of that went to the tech center. Okay, so there's seven million left in the downtown creed and seven million left in theory well, from the, those creeds. In the general fund total, yes. If you were to allocate them, because uh, there's nothing left in create accounts at this point. Right. Okay. Thank you. Councilmember Voland, go ahead. Uh, the second one: street maintenance for bus and bike lanes from public Public Works will get 2.0 million dollars in creed money. Uh, there are six streets named in this memo. Three of them: uh, Grant Street. Uh, 6th Street and Rogers Street are outside the creed. Uh, are these all going to be done at once? Uh, are there no other, uh, you know, streets in the, the creed that uh, need fixing? So this is, a, this is done by a prioritization of the condition of the street that our, our public works department's been doing. And in this case, uh, again, trying to leverage local match to get federal funds to repair the streets. I think what we see here is, although you say that they're outside the creed, they mostly are, there's a significant overlap in several of these projects with the creed. I would say Roger Street is the only one that is probably wholly with outside of the creed and that doesn't totally function it. But regardless, in terms of the, the, um, the way they're prioritized, in this case, it's focusing specifically on um, those, those roads that have uh, that is active bus lanes and then also bike lanes. And so to make those improvements for the bicyclist riding and, and make sure the bus experience is a little bit better. I understand the principle, but Mr. Allen, please, uh, can we zoom in on that? The 6th Street red line and the Grant Street red line are clearly outside the creed completely. They may be close to it or touching on it, but they're outside it. Am I, are you telling me I'm not seeing what I'm seeing? I think it's whether you interpret, it's, it, it, that's fine. I, it depends whether you interpret 6th Street, you know, in terms of there is a whole block essentially that's, that's adjacent to it that that street is serving. The, the creed is technically the parcels within the streets, but, you know, there's a significant overlap there in terms of the infrastructure there in terms of how it serves the creed. That's how I was interpreting it. I, I, I could see that there's a definitional difference between us, though. I mean, I'm trying to be true to the, the statute and the ordinance. That's the map. Those lines are outside the map. All right. Um, next is traffic signal modernization. How much does one signal cost to modernize? There's got to be some tangible amount. Will the 2.7 million modernize every signal in the city or just some of them? And if so, how many? Do we have any idea? I believe in this case, the, the hope is that all of the traffic signals in the city that we depict on the map would be updated with the modernization, including the ones that are overlap with the, the Creed districts. Because I, I think that that's part of the, the entire uh, purpose of wanting those interconnected to make sure that they coordinate, that they can speak to each other, that emergency vehicles uh, are able to communicate with the lights and potentially change them as they move through the city. So it, it, I think the plan there is to update all of them. Nevertheless, the, the question is still, how much does it cost to modernize one? And I, I don't have an answer to the question. I, I just want to make one other point, which is, um, as we've done throughout Recover Forward, the use of these one-time funds, the dedication of these one-time funds, we hope, we would intend, and I expect in the future will be intended to maximize leverage as much as possible with federal grants. This is a very rich environment over the next several years, so it's hard for us to know exactly how much money uh, these will generate. We hope it'll generate more than this and let us do uh, more things, but I just want to point that out. So, In this section, traffic signal modernization, there is no mention of this money leveraging federal funds. I, we don't know, Councilmember Volan, whether it will, but we will be seeking aggressively to pursue any federal money that is available. We, you have helped us fund a new grant, uh, grant uh, application. Uh, position which we will use earlier in this memo 
you talk about specifically in the first batch here, where is it? Uh, safe streets for all. You're literally leveraging federal funds. This one, you don't mention any of it, but now you're saying you might. Safe streets for all is a very specific program that we intend to use to leverage with federal funds. It's set up, it's been, we've been working at it. All I'm saying is that in many of these circumstances, having this one-time cash for infrastructure investment can help us leverage federal funds, whether through the Metropolitan Planning Organization or special discretionary grants at the federal level. So that's the only point I'm making. But for the purpose of this ordinance, you're trying to appropriate funds to spend on this particular thing, $2.7 million. And I will note that the question has not been answered. I don't know how many intersections are going to be upgraded with it and how much it costs to upgrade an intersection. Let's move on to one more. The Jobs and Climate Program. That sure, that happy question. to. Council Member Flaherty. Um, so the Creed districts no longer exist, is that right? That's correct. Okay. Um, and the money that's in the general fund can be used for any legal purpose for monies that appear within the general fund, is that right? That's correct. Okay. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Additional questions? Councilmember Sandberg? These projects that you have listed in the, the memo, and I certainly appreciate seeing the detail here. Um, are these things that have already been committed to um, that maybe are already underway, or are, are these aspirational programs that we're hoping into the next year, which of course is a next administration and a next council? Um, can you talk a little bit about where some of the, these projects are currently in terms of commitments or planning or consultant work or what have you? Yeah, I, I, th I believe. Uh Council Member Sandberg, that they're in a variety of stages in terms of level of commitment, you know, in terms of safe streets for all, part of that's an application, which we talked about in gathering the information and the data. Um, the, um, the street maintenance thing is something that we will do. I mean, we need to do, uh, maintain and keep on top of that. So it might be that we have to find uh, funds elsewhere to potentially replace those if, if, if we need to, to, again, to leverage the federal funds. And those have happened in a variety of circumstances if we can, but if we can't, then we'll just have to start deciding which to cut uh, from that particular program. Uh, the traffic signal modernization, I, I can't tell you where that is in that process, and I'm happy to follow up and get you those details. I'm, I'm just sorry I can't, I can't tell you as I stand here. And then, of course, the job and climate projects, there, there are a variety of those projects that are, require the creed, and some of those are under contract. So, for instance, for the solar panel maintenance, we obviously went under uh, a fairly significant energy savings guarantee contract a few years ago, which we uh, greatly increased our solar uh, capacity within the city and also uh, the number of solar panels that we have to maintain and systems that we have to maintain. So there's some maintenance money there specifically for those that include the solar panels on the garages on City Hall and, and things like that. Uh, there, there is also the solar energy and efficiency and lighting program is already underway. That has given out several grants already to nonprofits. Uh, it helps them to um, evaluate in terms of energy efficiency upgrades, but also the potential for solar and sustainable projects. That is happening now, although what the impact of this would be if we didn't have the money is that we can't fund those nonprofits going forward, potentially, or those programs going forward. Uh, and very similarly, you know, there's, there's uh, funding here to also just deploy uh, some of those facilities upgrades as well, uh, which is kind of interrelated and, and, and revitalizing the downtown businesses, which ESD has, has undertaken in some arts projects in terms of also utilizing storefronts and, and just tr trying to focus on that downtown and beautification. Additional questions? Councilmember Volan, did you want to continue? Thank you. Uh, I was getting to uh, the jobs and climate projects. Uh, $475,000 from the Creed for job support and growth economic development. It says a portion will be spent on developing the trades district and the certified technology plan, or the certified technology park, rather, the CTP. Three quarters of the park are located in District 6, granted. But how much of that portion will be spent? on the CTP. Yeah, we don't we don't have we don't have exactly what the the split is in terms of the proportion that would be towards the CTP versus other programs at this point. 
Uh, I see Ms. Warren is here. Can you speak to this at all? Any sense of what the priorities are for that money? Other development initiatives in concentrate on revitalization of downtown, good. Um, also support planning and transportation, engineering, hand and public works with initiatives serving the downtown. Will all the money be spent downtown? It looks like it will. Uh, so I'm Holly Warren, Interim Director for Economic and Sustainable Development. Um, I, I, I would leave it to my colleague, Dee Small, um, business development uh, AD for the city. Um, I, I don't want to commit, um, you know, based on our conversations together, she does say three quarters of CTP. I don't want to overcommit her to saying, yes, all of these monies are going to be spent in districts. It could extend beyond that. We just haven't done the math or done the planning yet to decide specifically where each one of these dollars is going to be spent. Clear. I'm, I mean, all of the creed is in District 6, and I'm concerned about money just being spent I understand in the creed. That, yes. But, uh, well, I, mean, I guess what I want to know is how did, did you did you decide, well, we have certain projects we want to do and we need this much money to do it? Or did you say, if we can get this much money, we might start doing these projects? Like, how do you compile what you're going to do? We, we always start out with a very, uh, when we were tasked with putting these dollar amounts together, we were asked to be very visionary. Our department is very visionary. We went big. We went larger than this amount of money when we were asking how many Creed dollars could be allocated for small business development. When we started making those asks, we weren't necessarily thinking solely about District 6 because that is not what we were tasked with doing. But I can acknowledge, especially for small business, and I can speak to for arts, I know our focus is primarily on CTP, Trades District, and downtown. So those ideas about where we were going to be spending our money just naturally gravitated towards those areas. But again, I don't think when we started putting these numbers and thinking about how we would spend these monies together, we weren't saying, OK, this district specifically. Right. We were thinking bigger picture. That's understandable. I'm yeah. just asking generally. So. The, how did you find out how much money would be in this particular pot? Did that was a negotiation with the mayor's office and the controller's okay. office. Okay, so yes. at but some point you said we'd like to do these things, and the mayor said, well, you can have this much. Yes, it okay. was, yes, yes. Okay. It's always a negotiation. The same go with more, the solar, yeah. the solar yeah. too, the, the next yes, one? Yes, that's correct. And yes. uh, the downtown activation. Okay, correct. that all looks like it's downtown. Thank you. Yes. I've got another question, but I can wait. Questions from other council members? Seeing none, please go ahead, Council Member Volan. Okay, uh, the affordable housing uh, for hand. Um, again, we have Hopewell, which is immediately adjacent to downtown, and Osage Place, which overlaps with the former Thompson Creek. How much does it overlap? I mean, I see the map here, but it looks like it, it, it's adjacent to it and not overlap. It's essentially a rhombus uh, with Osage Place in terms of the amount that it overlaps. I think where you see the, if we scroll down to Osage Place, it, I, I believe the, um, the creed goes straight across there where it intersects uh, with the perpendicular Osage Place line. So you have like a, a triangle or, or a rhombus there at the top. So uh, basically it's adjacent for to that. the creed. No, no, no. It is actually portions of the neighborhood are actually located in the Thompson Creed, um, but not the entire neighborhood is located in them. Is it correct to say that most of it is not in the creed? Sure. Yep. Okay. And let me, I, we should just be clear, this isn't, this isn't trying to say that everything's gonna overlap with the creed, we're, we're just trying to honestly portray where these are happening. So some of these are adjacent to the creed, but what we believe and what, what we've stated and I think is consistent is that even things that are next to the creed or immediately adjacent to the creed still serve those areas, serve those downtowns. And that's, that's a concept in, you know, at least in the economic development world that we've typically lived in that really it is functionally correct in terms of the businesses that are there, the businesses that were supporting this type of fund, the businesses that were donating essentially tax dollars that were going to go to the state that we've been able to capture in our community. These are all investments back into those areas, even if they're not strictly in the creed under the original statute, since we have broader authority, but we can serve those neighborhoods very well with these one-time projects. Okay, I have a final question. Um, this is a complicated one. Uh, some of the uh, items in this me memo satisfy me as being in the creed. I'd be willing to restore some of the cuts that I'm proposing. Uh, but rather than do that, because that may be moot, uh, I would just like to ask generally, how will this council know uh, once these projects are uh, funded that they will follow what is in this memo? 
how are we, I mean, how would you suggest that we expect to find out how the money was spent? So, so one is you see the results, and I think that that's a fair question to ask as in terms of the future budget presentations to come back and say, you know, this was the pledge last year. How were these funds spent? Where were they spent? Give us a detail about those. I think in other instances, like the Safe Streets for All and things like that, uh, those are actually part of, part of that application. Again, another aspect of it is council engagement. So there will be a resolution that council will have to consider for the Safe Streets for All. So you will see what the results of potentially of that safety plan are and have some input there. So it's just going to, it's going to depend on the program, just frankly. Uh, there are other projects, if we're talking about affordable housing, obviously in just a few weeks, you're going to hear affordable housing report from hand director John Zodi. Also, the Hopewell project is something that we try to keep council apprised of. It's obviously a large ongoing project. And so if that's something you're interested in, how that money might affect the Hopewell project and what it could be used for, uh, that's something that we'll continue to engage council on. Um, I think that, that that it's just going to depend on the projects, and I think the other the other way and the most likely way is you're going to see it on the ground as as it improves. You'll see the streets in action. You'll see the activation of downtown, and you'll see um, potential investments uh, in the traffic signal modernization. And hear more about that. If I may, I second all of that. I, I, at a high level question, I can't help myself to. I think it's a great idea. I'm I'm cautious because this is relating to the budget process, but as you know, we have, we think it's a good idea in the budget process itself for the council to say, show us the performance of the budget. As you know, we, we release twice a year the, this, the hundreds of specific goals that we have for each department, many of which would be covering this kind of uh, reporting. Um, the council has directed us to reduce the amount of reporting on results of, of past year and current year uh, investments in order to focus more on the next year of the budget. I do think it's very appropriate for a council to consider that balance, uh, and we try to provide a great deal of detail on the performance uh, in, in addition to all that Deputy Mayor Allen reported on. Well, I ask this because there's a current news item, and this is probably a question for you, Mr. Mayor, uh, having to do with the uh, entryways to the city. Uh, I went back and looked at Resolution 1823. Uh, I can have Mr. Lucas put the document up. Not only were there mistakes in the memo where the Griffey, uh, the Griffey Lake Trail and the entryways were estimated at 1.25 million in the memo, but in the um, budget sheet, they were estimated at 1.5 million, and we didn't catch that. But it says specifically, and let me call it up here. It says specifically, I'm reading from page 25 of the uh, meeting file that you sent, that I sent you. Um, this is the uh, memo from the administration. City of Bloomington entryways, estimated project costs 1.25 million. Beautification and related improvement projects at four or more entryways to the city of Bloomington to include consultant design, lighting, landscaping, signage, and tree planting. Well, now there's only one. This said four or more entryways. So what we approved five years ago is itself not coming to pass. Instead, you're doing one. Should we not believe the plain language of what you proposed to us? Because this is all that we got. There it is, right there. That's what we voted on. And now that amount of money, 1.25 million, is being spent on one. What am I supposed to make of that? Why should I believe? that the next project you're proposing now is going to be funded when this was changed. Do you see what I'm asking? I think I do. Circumstances change, costs. We, we did design for four entryways. Uh, we found that the cost to do the entryways was more than we thought. We had to pivot. We are planning two entryways instead of four, not just one. But okay. that's, been, that's been disclosed several times through the Parks Department. The plan is the Arlington Bridge over the, over the bypass. The last I knew that was canceled because the it's postponed, uh, was going to. It's postponed because that bridge, but we are still retaining the funds to do it. I this don't, is a bicentennial I'm, bond. I'm not privy to the news that you are, Mr. Mayor. But the point is, you describe one thing and then something else happens and you just say, but why shouldn't we be approving a project after you cost it out so we know what we're paying for instead of just uh, 
you, I mean, you're asking for 2.7 million here, 2 million there, round numbers with nothing specific, nothing specific. And then we get blowback years later because we didn't expect it either. How is this not the same thing as the Bearcat, which we passed an ordinance for anything that there's a change of more than $100,000 should come before the council? Why should I trust these numbers now when I, I, I relied on these numbers before and they've changed substantially, dramatically, to great uh, news in the paper? I guess, I, I guess if I try to plumb your question, the question, if, if we had to, we, we can't do projects without funding, pre-funding. We have to pay to do projects, to get projects designed and, and planned and do the public input for that. Then those projects need to be done. If, if the process were for every major project, if this, if this proposal is gonna fund, let's just say 30 projects, I don't know, altogether. If each of those projects had to come before this council after you appropriated planning and design money to get them ready for review, and then the council voted up or down on each of those projects, that would be a complicated way to run a government. Sorry? Is, when it came to annexation, you had to prepare a whole bunch of data to show us, and that's, you know, we didn't, you didn't ask us to do it without data. Uh, the data we're looking for here is the simple cost of the project. You give us a list of projects you want to do and how much each one costs. We don't know don't, the cost of the pro I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah, no, that's we, all right. We don't know the cost of the projects until we design, develop, bid, all of that depends on, on a lot of variables that we cannot tell you ahead. We can tell you the intent. We can tell when we welcome your direction. And if you say, I don't want you to do street improvements. I can't tell you if street improvements, if you give me $4 million, if you pro I can't tell if it's going to be 4 miles or 3.5 miles or 4.5 miles. Right, but in the case of the police garage that uh, was way overbid and so you had money you couldn't spend and the police department decided to spend it on the armored vehicle, that didn't come before us, it was a complete change of use. Uh, again, I'm looking to rely on the things you present us and how do I know they're not gonna change like this one did? I expect that this, this does not list very many specific projects at, at your, well, I'll just leave it at that. The specifics are very difficult to predict ahead. We appreciate the guidance of the council and the accountability. We're happy to report on those kinds of things, which we do frequently and happy to do that more. I guess my, my point is that this is not sufficient accountability, but thank you. Additional questions on Amendment 1 to Appropriation Ordinance 2305. Okay. Seeing no further questions, let's go to public comment before we come back to Council. If there's someone in Chambers who would like to offer comment on Amendment 1, please approach the podium. Mr. Lucas, can you extend our invitation on Zoom, please? Yes, if there are members of the public joining via Zoom that would like to speak to this amendment, please raise your hand in Zoom. You can do that by clicking on the Reactions tab or the More tab. You can also send a chat to the host to let us know you'd like to speak. I see no hands going up. Okay. Thank you, and I'm not seeing any takers here in Chambers. So let's come back to council for additional questions. Seeing none, is there final comment on Amendment 01? Council Member Bolin. It's gonna go, but I'm still gonna make the point. It took the threat of a cut just to get the memo we got at 530. Uh, a threat of a large cut, but we got it and I'm happy to get it. It's still not enough detail. But this is more a matter for the council than for the administration. If I were being a purist, I could argue that the $2 million that we could leverage federal funds with ought to leverage $8 million of federal funds that also stay in the creed, but I'm not that much of a purist. Uh, the principle is that, yes, the money was legally moved, but it was also a case of conversion by neglect the administration could have spent this money in the creed. The previous one could have done it too. The administration spent less than 10% of it. Less than 10%. And I guess it's okay. No one here objected. So forget the statute. It doesn't really matter. 
Part of the problem I have is that we're not willing to dig into the details. Uh, these funds, which have been converted by neglect, don't need to be spent now. We're not, it's not use them or lose them. Why are they being spent now? Why weren't they spent last year or two years ago? Because nobody noticed? I guess we didn't notice. But we don't have a finance committee. We don't have any committees, but most, the number one committee in every other city in the state is a finance committee that oversees the budget. We don't have to become like the county council or the county commissioners and review every payroll and claims every two weeks. But we could be doing more to ask questions about how the administration wants to use money, but we consistently don't. Instead, they say, well, we can ask for 2.7 million, and none of us really want to investigate it, so we let them have 2.7 million for this or that or whatever. And it doesn't matter how they actually spend it afterwards because we don't pay attention afterwards. Whether it's not raising the parking fees in the garages back when we built the garages in 2001 and three, because that was how we justified paying for it, to I guess not really caring about, uh, can you put that, uh, that page back up again? The uh, city entryways. Notice that the only picture used to illustrate the city entryways is the one entryway that matters to anybody, the one on the north side. That was the, the, the thing used as an example. I mean, I can't tell you how disappointed I am to be continually gamed like this. And I'm not sure who to be more mad at, my colleagues or the administration. Because in the end, I don't blame the administration for doing what they do to get what they want. But when somebody shows up and they don't have the answers for you, they don't know off the top of their heads. And that's a consistent thing that's happened to me for as long as I can remember. I'm used to being told, oh, nobody knows. I will say that in the previous administration, during budget week, every department head was required to show up here. That hasn't been the case here. But, I mean, it's sort of an existential frustration that I have. Like, am I really gonna miss this job? Because nobody checks anyway. Will the next council do more checking? Make sure that the administration does what they promised they would do? Will they follow up? I don't have a lot of hope. I'm happy to withdraw this amendment. Mr. Lucas, is anything else required for the withdrawal of the amendment? At this point, it's in front of the council. If a member would like to move to withdraw the amendment and there's no objection, you can do that by unanimous consent. If there is an objection, it's a majority uh, vote required to allow it to be withdrawn. Is I'm just saying that I would be willing to do it. I'm happy to hear other people's comments, but I sort of know where this is going. Additional comments? Council Member Sims or no? Okay. Well, it could be. So. I'm not seeing, oh, Council Member Sandberg? When Council Member Volan first started talking about this, I had some sympathy uh, because the creed is a very, um, you know, specific, allocation, but when the creeds were discontinued and the money was placed into the general fund, then of course it's in the general fund. And um, I think you were absolutely correct to ask for more specificity as to how the additional creed funding is going to be spent, and we got that in this memo today. Um, looking over the memo and briefly having this discussion, I guess I would just ask the public who we represent is the public all right with how some of this money is poss possibly going to be allocated? And again, I also have empathy for the administration when they say what comes first, the funding or the egg? I mean, you've got to have a commitment for funding, like with the case of the Bicentennial Funds, which is now kind of a big community dust up. But you've got to have the funding before you can actually start the wheels turning to how are we going to best use the bicentennial funds, or in this case, 
the remnants of the creed funding that are now placed in the general fund. Um, so I guess this exercise uh, would be important for me to make an appeal to the public. Pay attention, you know, and council representatives, talk to your constituents about what's on the table here to just kind of check in and make sure that the public is okay with many of these projects. Um, I think that's probably been lacking, and I know um, COVID has happened, and that has cut communications on a lot of things where we had funding allocated in 2018, 2019, and the projects didn't get put into play until much later in the administration. And then when people start hearing about it, they go, whoa, you know, nobody told me about this. I don't like this. So again, I guess this is just an appeal to the public, an appeal to all the council members who will be going forward into the next administration. Make sure the people that you represent are okay with these projects because this is a lot of money. And we wanna make sure that when projects are realized from the funding that is allocated, that is approved and okayed from years prior to anything coming to fruition, that it sits well with Bloomington and it sits well with the people we represent. Thank you. Thank you. Additional comments on Amendment 1? Council Member Volan? Let's be clear. The creeds weren't discontinued. The administration intentionally neglected it so they could use the money for whatever they wanted to. They're using it now. It was an intentional neglect. They could have spent the money. Who misses $10 million just sitting there? If there's anyone on this dais who doesn't like the obelisk we're about to get, let me point out that council members Piedmont, Smith, Sims, Rollo, and Sandberg all voted for Resolution 1823. I was the only person in the previous council who voted against it. Let this be a warning. Council members Sims and Sandberg are off the hook because they're like me retiring, but let it be a warning to council members Rollo and Piedmont Smith that you should be checking come the next term. You should be more, you should scrutinize the assertions that an administration makes when they come with a proposal with a nice round number. We're definitely getting the obelisk we deserve. I urge you to, well, I'm, I'm again, I, I'm ambivalent about the uh, amendment at this point, happy to withdraw it. If anybody wants to do it, I won't oppose it. Additional comments, council member Piedmont Smith. Well, my comment has nothing to do with this amendment, but it is a response to Councilmember Volan's comment. Is that permissible? Since he called into question me paying attention at a previous vote. Go ahead. Um, I uh, took that vote on the bicentennial bonds very seriously. Um, the administration packaged the uh, I think it was $1.25 million for the Gateway Projects with the planting of 1,400 public trees, which I did not want to vote against, and that was very clever packaging. I uh, spoke out against the Gateway Projects. I felt that it was a waste of money, um, that the city could speak for itself and didn't need some fancy Gateway. Um, so, yeah, it, you know, that was the, probably a political uh, move on the administration's part to put that along with the street trees, which I certainly wanted to support, and that's why I voted in favor of it. And I uh, really don't appreciate this being brought up um, as something that I did not pay attention to at the time, but let's not go back and forth on this. Uh, as far as the amendment goes, um, I am not in favor. I, I support the proposals that the mayor has brought forward for the creed and the former creed funds and the ARPA funds. I think they will be uh, overall uh, very beneficial for our community. Um, and therefore, I do not want to remove those appropriations. Thank you. Thank you. Additional final comments, Council Member Sims. Thank you. And I'll follow Council Member Piedmont Smith. I, I don't understand what mean off the hook means. I'm not on the hook. I just vote the conscience of my constituents, and that's, that's it. And I try not to get into the weeds of all this, but I will say this. Um, I'm just a two-term council member. Maybe I've not been paying attention, but I've, had, I've, I've got some colleagues been here five terms. 
what is that saying? And I'm not going there because I'm not so sure that's true and I'm not going to say that in order to flip or flop this discussion that we're talking about. But, um, you know, it's one thing that they say when one finger is pointing at you, you got two or three more pointing back at yourself. With that, I move to dismiss, I'm sorry, move to withdraw this motion. Amendment, sorry. We have a motion to withdraw this amendment. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any objection to withdrawing this amendment? Um, point, of, point of order, Madam President. Uh, it's my understanding that only the person who made, who uh, moved the amendment, or made the motion to move the amendment could actually withdraw it. Is that right, Mr. Lucas? I believe that's generally the case. Are there any objections to withdrawing this amendment? Seeing none, the amendment is withdrawn. That takes us back to Ordinance 2305. And to, are there any additional questions before we go to public comment on 2305? Seeing none, let's go to public comment. If there's anyone in chambers, please approach the, the podium. Mr. Lucas, can you please extend our invitation on Zoom? Yes, if there are mem members of the public that wish to comment on Appropriation Ordinance 2305, please let us know by raising your hand in Zoom. Uh, you can find the raise hand feature in your reactions button uh, by clicking the reactions button or the more button in your control bar. You can also send a chat to the host to let us know you'd like to speak. See no takers online. Okay, and seeing none here in chambers, let's come back to council for any remaining questions or for final comment on appropriation ordinance 2305. Councilmember Volan. This is how the creed ends, not with a bang, but a whimper. Uh, I think my raising of resolution 1823 was relevant because it goes to the relative lack of scrutiny that we give to requests from the administration for large pots of money. And with all due respect to my esteemed colleague uh, who has served two terms, uh, in my five terms, I've voted no an awful lot. And I've been the only person who's voted no. I'm used to it. But I would ask him why he doesn't believe that we shouldn't get into the weeds. Because I can just look at the three numbers here we were told that the city entryways would cost one and a quarter million, but 1.5 million was budgeted. Now it's only gonna be spent on one, excuse me now, two entryways, not four, as was promised. Uh, Councilmember Piedmont Smith, uh, the, other, the other two items were 800,000 for landscaping and trees and 450 for alley improvements. Councilmember Piedmont Smith didn't move to split it. I guess you can't split bonds. But we also didn't say to the administration, we don't like the way you're doing this. We want you to come back with bonds that are prioritized in a different way. And because of that, she voted for 1.5 million when it was only 1.25 million proposed. There's a quarter million dollars just floating around. What, did, what happened to that quarter million? I guess we don't care. And the shame of it is Councilor Piedmont Smith authored the ordinance to prevent future Bearcats. Well, this is the same year as the Bearcat. I guess we don't care about paying attention. Thank you. Additional final comments on Appropriation Ordinance 2305. Seeing none, Madam Clerk, is that a hand or is, no? No, it's, it's Okay, a it's a wave. It's, it's All right. Madam Clerk, if you would, please call the roll on Appropriation Ordinance 2305. Council Member Volan? No. Flaherty? Yes. Rosenberger? Yes. Sims? Yes. Piedmont Smith? Yes. Scambalori? Yes. Rollo? Yes. Sandberg? Yes. Smith? Yes. And that passes 8-1. Ordinance, appropriation ordinance 2305 is adopted. I believe we have one additional uh, item of business. Mayor Hamilton, if you would. 
Thank you very much. And Mr. Underwood, I hope you're watching your uh, screen. Could I have uh, all our staff who are here come up and stand next to me? Mr. Underwood, I don't know if you can see what I'm wearing here. This is a picture of the Norwood <laughs> tour, the farewell tour, the farewell tour with, um, can somebody show them the back too so they can see that? It's got a list of your budget, sir. We wish you were in the chambers, but I wanted to uh, read something to you. We'll have a copy of this for you too, and I thank the Council for your indulgence, and actually uh, uh, Beth Kate too for organizing some of this. But I want to read a proclamation, if I may, Mr. Underwood. All right, you listen. Can you hear me? I can hear you. I'm, okay, good. I'm... Whereas Jeff Underwood has served as controller of the City of Bloomington for 14 years, with 25 years of city service, and he announced plans to retire at the end of 2023. And whereas Jeff's dedicated work for the city began in 1985, where he served as the assistant director for 11 years in the controller's office before taking the role of city controller in 1996, which he held for three years before returning to it in 2014. And whereas Jeff has served in three past city administrations of mayors Fernandez, Cruzan, and Hamilton, showing long lasting influence in our city's governance and progress, and whereas in his role as controller, Jeff acts as the city's chief financial officer, and he and his department oversee all financial transactions, the department's divisions and departments and hundreds of millions of dollars. And whereas in his time with the city, according to our records, Jeff has developed and presented 13 of those most central annual city budgets in the council chambers with his 14th and final presentation on Wednesday, October 11th, 2023, we're getting there, hang in there. And whereas Jeff brings great financial acumen and a highly sophisticated understanding of public accounting and public finance, along with a down to earth sense of humor, an infectious unselfishness and an indefatigable dedication to the public good. And whereas Jeff brought a fiscal discipline and frugality that assured our city government stayed strong with reserves and capacities through thick and thin, and also brought great ambition for our community. That meant he supported transformational investments in infrastructure and key projects, as well as salaries for our workforce and maintenance capacities for all our properties. And whereas the city of Bloomington will benefit for generations to come from Jeff's wisdom and forward thinking his commitment to quality and fairness, and his vision for a thriving community that works for all. And whereas Jeff, AKA Norwood, Dr. No, Firewood, Under Armour, Captain Jeff, and more, has entertained scores of colleagues with his wry wit, twinkling eye expressions, and Zoom meeting signboards. You know what I'm talking about keeping the serious job of public service in perspective and helping all around him enjoy life as he does. And whereas Jeff protected his privacy and rich personal life, in fact, even to the extent of having a heart attack and driving himself to the hospital and trying to keep it a secret from his colleagues who wouldn't allow it and cheered him on in his wonderful recovery and resumption of service. And finally, whereas like you, Jeff, we will all do our best not to let anyone, quote, take away our joy, quote, and we'll seek to follow you as an exemplar of public service done right with dedication and humility and excellence. Now, therefore, I, John Hamilton, mayor of the city of Bloomington, do hereby proclaim October 11, 2023, as Jeff Underwood Day in Bloomington, Indiana. Congratulations, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it, it, uh, Don't say anything. We're, we're still clapping. We're still clapping. Oh, okay. Come on. Come Just standing O. To you. Uh, it, it's it's been my pleasure to to work uh, with so many wonderful wonderful people over the years, uh, uh, from Mayor Allison to Mayor Hamilton to scores and scores of council members 
and all the great staff that both worked for and worked with me, department heads. It's been fulfilling. Obviously, I came back at the behest of some folks and have enjoyed my tenure, but it's time to ride off into the sunset and enjoy some time away. I would like to say that I would watch future meetings, but that would be a lie. So I won't miss the long nights, but I will miss all the people and the back and forth with the council. I always felt like I was happy to take questions and answer them to the best of my abilities, regardless of what people's positions were. And it's been a pleasure to serve the citizens and people of Bloomington. You know, I'm a native. I was I've lived here my entire life, was born in what's now the core building. And I'm happy to see that it's going to be kept as a special place in my heart. And I don't have any plans to move. I plan to stay in the community and enjoy all the amenities that not only have we built, but others in the county as well. So thank you so much. Thank you for that great proclamation. Thank you for the Norwood. One of the more memorable times in that chamber. And thank you so much. We've got a T-shirt for you, Jeff, and we appreciate remembering all of us in public service work together. And we esteem the dedication to the good of the public that you exemplify. And it's a good lesson for all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And not nearly as heartwarming as a matter of council schedule. So the council committee on council processes has a scheduled meeting on Monday of next week. So we will see the folks on that committee then. Otherwise, we have a regular session on Wednesday of next week. That's the last meeting of this month. And please stick around after the meeting. The clerk will need signatures from all of you on two of the items that were adopted tonight. So please see Clerk Bolden for those. Thank you. Thank you. So again, everyone stick around for signatures. Is there anything else for the good of the order? Seeing nothing, we are adjourned.